Talk Podcast. What's up? Chef Sucio here, chilling, studio, Oakland. What up? Representing out here, uh, the dining scene in the Bay Area, as well as the world. But we'll start with the Bay Area first. Uh, reissuing episodes. All right. There's a motorcycle outside. I'm not sure if you can hear that. I can. But I digress. We got Jason McKinney. Jason McKinney. That's episode four. Cuatro. Episodio cuatro de Sucio Talk. Okay. Um, let me read the caption that I wrote for Jason I dropped this episode on December 11th, 2020. December 11th, 2020. Fourth episode. I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't have any idea what I'm doing. But we'll figure it out. All right, here I go. Jason McKinney. He's known on Instagram as Captain Love Boat. Uh, As a CEO and founder of Truffle Shuffle SF, uh, I met this man through Tyler Vorse. When Jason started working at the French Laundry all of those years ago, the hustler in his spirit is a wise one who looks to inspire and change the culinary landscape for working chefs all over the world. Truffle Shuffle. From truly humble beginnings to working his ass off to become a great chef to owning his own successful business that's not even a, not even a pandemic could keep down. If, if anything, pandemic made it better. All right. Um, ladies and gentlemen, episode four of Sucio Talk. Presents one of the truest people I've come to know, Jason McKinney. Uh, that was back when it was on Spreaker. No longer on Spreaker. I'm on Anchor now. It's a video podcast. It's what we do. It's all good. Um, uh, you as listeners, you're out there. You know when it sounds shitty. Uh, I've had actually had somebody <laughs> recently meet in person. But like, your podcast is great, but sometimes it sounds like shit. So let me... Uh, trying to make sure that that doesn't happen and sometimes it sounds great you produce it put it on youtube when you put it on youtube it sounds like shit i recently got hit up to be um a possible host on a tv program and during the process i gave him all of what i thought was my best work he said none of this is good all of this is garbage <laughs> so i had to go back to the drum board make it happen you know um do I know if I got the show? No, but we'll figure it out. Even if it's not a step uh, towards the right direction, it's still a step, you know, which is better than taking step backwards or taking no steps at all, right? So super excited to be able to bring to you Jason McKinney. Uh, no longer going to be a chef. He's a CEO now, killing at, kicking it. I uh, almost said killing ass. <laughs> He's not killing ass. Um, partied with him this past weekend. Cool ass dude. Uh, become kind of like a, a business mentor to me. He's a he's a guy who he'll learn something and then he will let you know what he knows. He's not one of those guys that knows and then doesn't share the information. Okay. Other than that, chilling this week. Uh, going to uh, the fluff party. Fluff party. San Francisco, it's like a basically a club with video on the wall. It's like a all immersive, kind of like that Van Gogh. I think they put on that Van Gogh exhibit where it's immersive, right? So they got the art all over the walls, and you're in it, kind of like one of those uh, those little light boxes that you buy that make you look like you're in space, but you're in your room, uh, which you know wouldn't be a bad idea for those mushroom dinners I want to host, right? With that, I leave you. I'll see you next week. I have on some pretty cool shows. I got um, Hungry Hungry Hooker. I saw her at the Slug Bar Party, so I'm going to get her to be on the show, as well as talking to uh, Navy Venegas up there at Barn Diva. Uh, I'm going to get her to do the podcast. I also want to start panels up. I want to be doing panels fucking every day if I can, you know, so... um, if you guys are out there doing dinners, chefing it about, come up to the studio. We'll talk shit. 
for after service editions of Susio Talks. Um, and we'll go from there. With that, I leave you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Susio Talk. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to uh, thank all of you for your continued support. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, you can visit my Facebook page. It's uh, Susio underscore talk. Um, you can find that under my name, David Gijoti. For all of you who are my Facebook friend, come join me. I'm also happy to field any questions anybody has about previous episodes or people that you'd like to uh, see on the show. Let me know. Uh, you can follow the link to email me at my Facebook page, or you can write into susiotalk at gmail.com, susiotalk at gmail.com, no underscore there. You can also DM me at David underscore Susio. That's my uh, Instagram name. Uh, I want this podcast to be of the community. I want to uh, include you guys as much as I can, you chefs out there. Um, so for this first round, uh, I'd like to... Uh, to hear about crazy workplace stories, whether that has to do with service, um, cooking, or anything food-related in general, or any cool stories, regardless of what they have to do with. Um, I'll do my best to field all the emails and uh, kind of do uh, a little story per episode. Don't also be afraid to tell your friends about this podcast, um, to raise awareness about it. I'm trying to blow this up so it, uh, it's on a global market. But we'll see. I just started last month. This uh, podcast is available on Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker as of now. I'm working on uh, dropping it on iTunes as well. And just letting you know a little bit about what's coming up, we have our next guest, which will be episode five, um, will be Mia Khalifa and Robert Sandberg. Chef Robert Sandberg worked at Noma. I also worked at Franson when they won three stars. He's now working on his own project. Uh, Mia Khalifa um, is uh, an amazing person, cool, cool friend to uh, to be able to go and interview and see what she's been up to. She leads an interesting life, so um, I think you guys will be interested in what she has to say. Past that, uh, the next episode after Mia and Robert is Chef Costow. Uh, super happy to be able to, to uh, sit down with my mentor and pick his brain a little bit about his younger years uh, forming himself as a chef. All right. So this is uh, David Susio signing off. And uh, please enjoy this next episode. This is Jason McKinney, episode four. Susio Talk. <laughs> Bienvenidos, welcome, welcome to Sucio Talk. I'm sitting here with my boy Jason McKinney. We gotta let the music stop a little bit before I start talking. But uh, hey, how are you, Jason? Nice to see Yo. you. Cheers. Cheers, David. Hell yeah. We're drinking Modelo's at the uh, first incarnation of the Truffle Shuffle uh, headquarters. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. The second, actually. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of uh, employees have lived here. Mm -hmm. Tyler lived here. Yep. Um, I've lived here. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. But, you know, I've stayed here a lot of times. Um, so let me introduce Jason. He is a, a great chef uh, and a great mentor to many now that he is co-founder and CEO, am I right, of Truffle Shuffle. You guys know a little bit about Truffle Shuffle because I talked to Tyler last time I was here. And they are, uh, as of now, the unofficial sponsor of Sucio Talk. All right, so truffleshuffle.com, check it out. So Jason McKinney, how are you? Excellent, excellent. And you can make us the official sponsor. All right, there you go. You hear it first, the official sponsor, Truffle Shuffle. All right, so you know here at Sucio Talk, I like to take it all the way back. Mm -hmm. You know, I know what you've been doing this year, and we'll get to that later. But before that, sir, where were you born? Uh, originally born in Orlando, Florida. Orlando, Florida. Florida? Yeah. Damn. All right. And mom and dad, who who are they? What do they do? Uh, my parents met back there. My dad uh, has always kind of been a hustler. Okay. An entrepreneur himself. Very cool. Uh, my dad at the time had a car lot, and then he was 
bought a couple houses. He was renting out houses and met my mom. My mom needed a room to rent and he rented the, he was he was paying like 500 bucks a month on this house but rented it to my mom for like 300 bucks. That's sick. And then that's how they met and so now my mom is a dog groomer and then my dad is uh going for it. There you go, man. Hell yeah. yeah. Mom and dad, shout out to mom and dad. Very cool. So then uh you grew up there in Florida, did you move at any point, or did you kind of stay stay there your whole uh, school career? Yeah, all the way up until about, you know, 18. It was always back and forth between Florida and Georgia. Okay. Where in Georgia? Uh, right outside Atlanta. Okay. And then what was uh, what was all that about? Just jobs or just wanting to move there because you had family? Yeah, so my dad just kept growing his business. So he started his first car lot in Orlando, McKinney Motors. Okay, McKinney I got Motors. A- a picture I'll show you with, you know, he's got the mustache and That's awesome. has all the old, you know, like the Chevy vans and the Impalas on his lot. Yeah. Um, what and, year was this? What year are we talking? I mean, it, the picture looks like it's in the 70s or 80s. So, uh-huh. you know, he, I think he's like 56 and he started his first car when he was 18. It's 2020. So whatever that math is. Damn, that makes me feel like shit. 18, <laughs> he had his own car lot. Yeah, he never worked for anybody else. I was playing Grand Theft Auto. Pretty much. Damn. All right. And so, you know, he went up to Georgia, opened up some car lots up there, and then his goal was to retire before 45, and he did that. And then we awesome. moved to the Keys, where he, you know, invested in real estate down there. Very cool. And then the Keys, what was that like? Uh, the Keys was cool, you know. It's a very beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. Very small place. It's a lot like... When I hear Tyler talk about Maine, you know? Yeah, yeah. Very similar, but like the exact opposite. Right. Whereas, you know, growing up in the Keys, it's a small community. There's like four or 500 kids that go to the high school. And then everyone kind of does the same activities. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone needs to go out boating. The Keys is really cool. It's actually, it's 100 miles long, right? It's like, and then there's about 90 different islands. And so it's just one long strip. Okay. And... It's so long, but across doesn't go more than a mile wide. Wow. So you can, you know, kind of ride your bike from one side to the other. And on one side, you have the ocean. And the other side, you have the gulf. Whoa. So, you know, every day you can go out wake skating, wakeboarding, fishing. Damn. Now, how long did you stay there? For about two years. And then, you know, moved down there. Or actually about five years. So... Middle school up until second year of high school, and then moved back to Florida. Moved back up to Georgia. Okay, very cool. And then uh, you're in you're in high school. What were your interests then? Were you cooking then? Were you What were you doing? Uh, In high school, I was um, basically always in trouble. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Before I turned seventeen, I uh, had two felonies. Really? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Do you want to name those felonies? Uh, you know, I've really never told anyone these, but I figured we'd go for it All with right, this podcast. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. Let's do so talk. Say, say what you feel, baby. And so, you know, as a kid, my dad was always working and honestly just, I, we kind of just took care of ourselves, you know? Yeah, for sure. And so the first time I really got into trouble was for uh grand theft of a firearm. Okay. And then the... Second time was for a DUI. A DUI. Okay, got you. Well, the second one's pretty normal. You know, I think everyone gets a DUI at least some point. Yeah, it you know? was. <laughs> it's like it's like a common thing, especially in Napa, man. They, they're just looking for you. You know, you get you like go get a morning coffee, you get a DUI. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so I mean, you know, you you're in the system, right, for a little bit, and like, what made you not want to do that anymore? You know, in the everything for us came down to 2008. Okay. And so, like I said, my dad was growing his business. And, you know, he always kind of had a drug problem. Yeah. And so, growing his business, always had kind of a problem with just, you know, anything that would help him go faster. Yeah, I hear you. Very hard worker, you know, really brilliant guy, but just always thought he needs to be going faster, mm-hmm. you know? And when you always are trying to go faster, inevitably, the way life works, it will make you slow down. 
Yeah, for sure. And so when 2008 hit, he was just a little too far ahead of himself and lost his entire business. Okay. So at the time, he had, you know, about 100 employees, was just uh, just too too far out ahead, couldn't make rent, couldn't make payroll. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I watched my dad lay every single person off that he ever worked with and just kind of unbelievably spiraled out of control. Yeah. And so as a very young kid, I watched my dad go from, you know, being this, you know, kind of heroic figure in my life to in like three months, he totaled three cars. Yeah. He would stay up for five, six days at a time, you know, doing math, staying up, trying to figure out how to like save the business. Yeah. And then go drive a car somewhere, total it. And so as a young kid, I put together $3,000 to have an intervention for him. And he wanted to go get help, so we completely broke off anything that had to do with my dad. Mm-hmm. And that was you, your mom? Yeah, and then I got two sisters and a brother. Okay, so you all decided we got to go. You know, it was, it's like, if you won't get help, all we want from you is your love. We don't need we don't need your money. We don't need anything, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so that took, you know, our family, and we went from being, you know, well off to dead broke yeah now where did you move from there so we were still in georgia Mm -hmm. and so you know my dad had a couple car lots so we moved closer to atlanta but still on the outside in alpharetta Uh uh-huh and we're in one house and essentially it was either you know find a way to figure this out or you know kind of get totally fucked yeah exactly At 16 years old, honestly, like, it was, like, overnight, I just cut out all the bullshit, got two jobs, started working two jobs, and just tried to figure out a way to make sure we could just pay bills at the house, you know? What were those jobs? I worked, basically, I worked in the morning at a breakfast restaurant. Uh Uh-huh. I worked on the griddle station. Okay. What are you making? A little English muffins? We, a little, it was like a... On the right side, I had the waffle station. Yeah. Oh, love and the then waffle station. The, you know, I made all the pancakes, and then mm-hmm. everything that came off the griddle, the potatoes, the toast. Sick, man. Hell yeah. So, and then what's your other job? And so I did that 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then at 5 p.m., I would go to, like, an alternative school. Uh-huh. And then I did an alternative school from 5 to 8. And then on the weekend, I worked at another breakfast restaurant. Okay. So two breakfast restaurants, getting breakfast under your belt as a young cook. Now, at this point, are you like, this is what I want to do? Or are you like, this is is my job? You know, before everything went down with my dad, I was unrealistic on, like, how the world worked, you know? And so I wanted to be a music producer. I was like, yo, I'll be a music producer three days a week and a chef two days a week. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's a hell of a part-time job you know? i was dead serious i looked into like both like the schooling and everything and i was like yeah that that'll be awesome okay <laughs> and then i got this you know, I, I applied to it was like 175 positions before someone would finally take me yeah i had long hair at the time and uh got this one job and i remember the first day that the restaurant was just unbelievably busy mm-hmm. you know what i mean you know that like level of like you know, like busyness or insanity where everybody doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like there's not one person that's like, all right, I'm going to take charge here. Yeah. And the first time I like saw that and felt it, I like just looked around and I was like, this is my home. This is awesome. Yeah, exactly. It's like, no, everybody's looking at everybody else. Like who's going to fix this? And it's like, well, I guess we'll wait till after service. And <laughs> it's just like everybody for themselves. One hundred percent, and just like the the uh, just that fe- that rush of excitement, you know, yeah, okay. and then doing things, seeing a result, you know, making these pancakes, okay, these are nice, making them a little bit, making them slightly different, okay, these are dope, yeah, these are not good, this, yeah, constantly like correcting yourself and being like, nah, you know, uh, so from a young age, I mean, you were super self critical and and ambitious, I mean. Two jobs, and then you say, I'm going to be part-time music producer, part-time chef. You know, that's... I wasn't thinking about that shit. I'll tell you what. I was like, how could I not work? You know what I mean? 
But uh, that's that's pretty cool, man. So you're in this stage in your life. You're cooking. You 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 finally have that moment where you're like, this is it. At that point, do you move on to another restaurant, or do you kind of just stay where you're at and then bide your time before you move on? Yeah. So I. It was a, honestly it was a big turning point in my life, because uh, even you know you don't make a lot of money at those places, and you know we were in a, as a family we we're in a bad position, yeah. and so you know one day we got an eviction notice on the door, and my mom had to you know I had to move her into a smaller house, and mm-hmm. there's only one house available at the time, and you know it was just not a very nice place, yeah, and. We moved in, into that house, and, um, like, just to give you an idea, like, literally, my mom and my two sisters would all sleep on the couch together. Yeah. Because that was the only place that had a furnace, you know? So they, they all would, you know, my two, like, you know, teenage sisters and my mom would sleep on the couch together in this house because there's no heat. Mm-hmm. And so when, in that transition of her moving into there, um... I had been looking for, like, you know, what is my next move? Mm-hmm. And I actually uh, made a fake college resume okay, and applied to Disney for their college internship program. Uh-huh. And it was a program where you went, and so this is back to Orlando. And you'd go, they would give you an apartment, a paycheck, and then you would be, like, in, I, you know, like, in some sort of sector that you would want to learn about. So it was a really great program. So you, you could do like food and beverage or housekeeping or, you know, marketing or whatnot. And so and I got accepted to this thing, moved my mom into this smaller house. And then I came to her one day and I was like, I was like, honestly, mom, I can't leave. Yeah. I was like, I'll stay here. I'll get another job. I'll figure out a way to make sure that we, you know, I help you pay the bills. And she told me that you have to help yourself before you can help others. Yeah. And so I actually finished high school like a eight months early. Uh-huh. I went from being like legitimately like probably the worst grades possible. In between those felonies, I got kicked out of nine different high schools. Jesus. So if you could imagine like my GPA was like a 0.2. Yeah. And then I went to – when I went to the alternative school, I could just work on my own pace. So I I did four years with the high school and about nine months and then <laughs> got to the end of it and got accepted to this college program at Disney. And I was like, all right. And then I went down to Disney and all of a sudden I was 18, 17 years old with my own apartment in Orlando, Florida. Sick. How was that? <laughs> It was awesome. Uh, I bet. Damn. And so, so, tell me about this fake college resume, because this is pretty impressive here. Yeah. So, I mean, legitimately at the time, you had to be in college to yeah. get into this thing, and so I was not in college, but I needed a place to live. Yeah. You know. So, what college did you fake go to? So, legitimately, I. Uh, as part of finishing up my high school, there's a college called uh, BYU, Brigham Young University. Uh-huh. And they do a really good, like, remote learning program. They, like, you could be in high school and, like, fail this class. And then they'll send you a packet. You do that packet, send it back to them. And then they send you the credit you need for that class. Yeah. And it's accepted by, like, all schools. So I knew about this school. And so... Got a hold of someone's fucking college transcript, uh-huh. and it was literally like a Kinko's job, you know, like went to Kinko's, <laughs> copy and paste. <laughs> that is amazing. Forged this thing, sent it to Disney, and then got to Disney. And Disney is one of the only employers in the world that has access to the FBI records. Really? So. When I got there, they found out about my previous uh, charges, which I never got charged, uh-huh. right? I got all the way up, you know, all the way up to, like, the thing, and the, the, uh, we're able to get the charges dropped on both things. Okay. With the first incident, uh, there's actually 
200 individuals I wrote letters to the judges just being like, Jason made a mistake. You know, please give him a second chance. And so I only spent uh, about three months actually in juvie for that, Mm -hmm. which I could have been looking at 10 years. Yeah, for sure. And so they found out about that. And then I sent Disney all these letters and the kind of what everything that happened and it went through an approval process and they approved me to work at Disney. And so then here I was 17. I worked at their uh, all-star music hotel. Okay. Which if you can imagine, they literally served 2000 people an hour. That is insane. It was. And what were you, what state were you in the kitchen? So I thought I would be in the kitchen, uh-huh. right? Food and beverage internship. I was like, well, this is awesome, you know? Yeah. And I remember, like, showing up, talking to the chefs, you know, just being so excited. Yeah, yeah. And I ended up being kind of like – it was like a food court, right? Yeah. And so guests would come in, and what it was was, like, Disney does all these – uh like Disney owns ESPN, so they host all of like the, um, like band camp competitions or yeah. the national cheerleader competitions. Oh, uh, what up, Ian? How you doing, man? We got Ian rolling in on the. We podcast. got Ian Rosen Shock over here. What up, Dave? What up, man? How what up, doing? Ian? Chilling. You know, we're on the set, chilling out. <laughs> all right, here we go. And so they would do. All those competitions there, and you would need somewhere for every single high school that has a band to stay. Yeah. And that's what these places were. And so you would have these waves of, like, band kids coming through or cheerleaders coming through or, like, the football kids coming through. And, if you, you know, just like a food court, and they had, like, their little Disney section. So this was the bakery. This was the grill. This was the... The sandwiches or whatever. Yeah. And then the, behind that was the actual kitchen where these guys weren't really cooking. They were just heating up like, you know, all the pizzas came and frozen and then all the soup was in bags and things like that. So they would just kind of feed the line and then I would stay in there and like put french fries in platters or like people would come up and point at like, I want that and that. And I would put it together on a tray. And hand it to him. The most cooking I did was we would put sandwiches through a press. Uh-huh. And so I was supposed to be there for nine months. After four months, I so desperately, truly wanted to learn how to cook. Yeah. I ended up finding a culinary apprenticeship program in Dixville, Notch, New Hampshire. Uh-huh. And I applied three days before the deadline, was able to get in. And this place agreed to give me chef coat and knives and Another place to stay. Yeah. And I agreed, took a little bit of money I had saved up, bought a truck, drove to New Hampshire, and all of a sudden, I was now living in New Hampshire working at a resort called The Balsams. The Balsams. Okay. And then, did you go right into the kitchen there? Yeah. Okay. But again, um, in order to get into there, I made a fake resume Uh (laughs) and took all the positions that I was like a dishwasher or cook at you know yeah and just said that i knew a lot more than i did Uh uh-huh and they actually looked at my resume and they thought i knew how to cook a lot more than i did so i got there and it was like kind of it was like a apprenticeship program through the acf yeah and so it was like a three-year program and the whole idea was you start out year one you're only like in garmage or over here Year two, you get a little bit more responsibility. Year three, only guys that had been there for three years would go on the hotline. Yeah. And for some reason, they I was like the last person that they let into this thing. And literally my first day, they put me on the hotline. Because they had seen your resume and they're like, this guy can bang. Yeah, they're like, this guy's got all sorts of experience. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. And then what was that like? It was nuts. The this place would do seven hundred covers a night, and that first service though, like, did you do well? Did you survive? You know, what was that service like? The first service was I was on the crab cake station, which you know probably would have been like the easiest thing in the world now, but back then I was just like, 
It was crab cakes, wilted spinach, and gravy sauce. And if I think about it, literally the pickup was like, so all the crab cakes were already seared. You uh-huh. just put them in the oven by the sheet tray, you know, and then yeah. held them hot. <laughs> <laughs> And then the spinach, they would wilt like a bunch of spinach at a time and then hold that hot. This sounds like possibly the easiest service I've ever <laughs> heard of in my life. <laughs> and then it was like gribbish sauce that literally was like, you know what I mean, like just Dollop. dolloped on these crab cakes. And so, yeah, it should have been. And I don't think I completely went down, but yeah. I did not have a clue what I was doing. Okay. I was like, do I temp? every single crab cake with my thermometer and i i didn't understand the concept of like firing or like you know what i mean yeah. so i was so just like fire and you're like yeah i truly i was just like um all right and then there's one chef up there chef Harmon. he was really awesome worked with me a lot yeah um so they realized at that point they realized they were like okay maybe he's not as good as he says he is on his resume did they ever question it were they ever like hey man you know what's up that ended up being the truly i can say one of the hardest like times of my life okay i had never throughout high school and everything you know even when i was like getting in trouble i always had you know my friends and yeah um i never was like an angry kid Mm -hmm. you know but i also never like really partook in like bullying anyone or getting bullied it was just not something I ever, like, experienced. And working there, truly, I, like, got bullied. Mm-hmm. Like, legitimately bullied every day. And you had, you know, 20-something guys. And up in New Hampshire, all those kids, every single one of them spent, in their high school, they spent four years in, like, a culinary program. You know, like, a technical vocation, right? And I, you know what I mean, made milkshakes and... Served French fries at Disney, yeah. and then before that, I made pancakes, and then I was a dishwasher, and I would cook at home all the time. I loved cooking, mm-hmm. and so I rolled up there, and then they threw me on the hotline. And I, I don't think it was like a, I think it was like a just like a just cause thing. Like they're like, oh yeah, let's put them over here, you know? Yeah, yeah. It was a chef's first year doing this, and so all the kids were just pissed at me. Yeah, I had no, ex- and rightfully so, I had no experience. I was working the station that everyone else would have taken two years to work. Yeah. You know? And so, um, there was this one guy there, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Metzik, and yeah. he was just a total dick. <laughs> I hope he's doing great now, but at the time, uh, and he was supposed to be like the lead on the hotline, you know? Yeah. And he honestly just would take like every, every step possible to make sure i was not set up for success yeah and we would do the sabotagers like total sabotage you know what fuck you sabotagers out there yeah this is a a message from sucio talk if you're caught in the walk and over salting some shit on purpose because you want to fuck somebody over i will fight you you understand me in these streets out here yeah thank you david yeah fuck that and it was legitimately that it was you know i mean like over salt and sauces like we would do these like split shifts oh. where uh, you would go in in the morning and prep like 7 to 10 and then come back and work service. And someone else is supposed to set your station up for like a 400, 500 cover night. Oh my goodness. And every time I would come back in one hour before service and this kid would never set my station up. And every day I would figure out a way to get set up and learn how to do these things, you know? Yeah. The The... It all clicked for me the first time I figured out counting. Like, yeah. like, and it was a very strange system. I don't know if you have ever seen anything like this. Have you ever heard of table de haute? No. So it literally. Oh, I, it was a term on a culinary school thing, but that's, yeah. that's all I remember. That's not, nobody's brought that up in years. Yeah, and then this place literally was ran like. They tried to run it exactly like how a scoffier would run a kitchen. You, we all wore neckerchiefs. What Tall chef hats, neckerchiefs. You you get, like, your nails inspected, like, everything every day, right? Yeah. And the way that service worked was the 
everyone had like an options package. Yeah. It was just like a cruise ship, right? And I, I have not seen anything like this since in my life. Uh-huh. And so that's – you would – the the kitchen was the size of half a football field. No okay. joke. Massive. Whoa. And you would be working a station and to place – there was no tickets. To place an order, they would come up and put a, a dish cover, right? Yeah. A cloche. One of those metal ones. And you would count your cloches. And however many cloches, you just had to be ready for that many dishes. Yeah. And so then it when wasn't they... even order fire. It was fire. Yeah. It was like... And then to pick it up, they would just put a plate up. Yeah. And as soon as the plate went up, you're supposed to get the food out the door. Okay. And so the first time that I really figured out like how to count all my cloches, count all my mise en place, and like get a good running count the whole night yeah. as opposed to just nonstop sandbagging everything. Yeah. Was that I remember it was like I was doing this cassoulet dish with like three scallops, two shrimp, and you know, the beans and the cassoulet and everything. And yeah. literally it was one of those nights where everyone was like, all right, Jason's going to go down tonight. Yeah. And I made a point to not go down. And that was like kind of like the turning point after that night. Started getting a little bit more respect from everyone. Yeah, for sure. But I was, I didn't know anything. The first time, that's like, that is the place I cut an onion for the first time. Okay. And I, I literally, I cut it, the whole onion, cut the tip off, sliced the onion in half. <laughs> like, like whole. Yeah, like, no. <laughs> like this. Like not the way you're supposed to cut it in half. No, I didn't, I didn't cut it in half and I then mean, do equator. two halves. You cut it in the equator. Yeah. Oh, man. And then I totally, as I'm doing this, I slice my hand open. Oh. And then at this stage, all the chefs got called over and are like, why are you cutting onion like that? And I'm like, this is how I've always cut onions. <laughs> 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 While trying to make sure they don't see my gash in my hand. And so I had to proceed with chopping the entire onion while my hand was bleeding. And they're like, that is the worst way we've ever seen <laughs> to cut an onion. No, it reminds me of uh, one time I did a demo for the front of the house team um, at Charter Rope. I know they're, they're all going to know, but I cut myself so bad, but was able to get a glove on before it started spurting all over everything. You know? So I got that first one on, and then I slipped the second glove on, you know, just to make sure that, you know, nothing nothing came out. And uh, the GM after is like, hey, I saw you put that second glove on. Did you cut yourself? And I'm like, who else knows? <laughs> I was like, I just embarrassed myself by the whole front. That was deep, man. What the fuck? Uh, so you're doing these services. You're getting your ass kicked. You're getting some respect now. And uh, how many? How, ma- how much time are we into this restaurant now? So I stayed there a little over a year. Mm-hmm. One day I told the chef there that I wanted to work for a chef named Thomas Keller. And he thought that was the funniest thing he had ever heard. And so that was about halfway into my time there. I told him that. And from that point on, he nicknamed me Keller. And then, like, there's one night in particular, literally, uh, I had messed something up. And he came back into the kitchen and started chucking plates at me. Mm-hmm. Smashed one on my leg, smashed one behind me, and just was like, like, come on, Keller, you'll never get it. Yeah. You will never figure this out. You think you could ever work at the French Laundry? And that was the moment when I knew that at some point I would, like I could never work for the chef. You know, I used to the the my at that time in my life, my greatest fear in the entire world was the day that I was gonna have to introduce that guy to my mom. Yeah. And my mom was always my biggest supporter. She would anything Chef Keller related she would send me you know yeah. recipes clippings anything you know when I wasn't there for the holidays she would make dishes from Chef Keller's recipes mm-hmm. you know as a way to like for us to like still bond you know yeah and I was honestly I used to think about it I was like how like I, I it was it was like three years away but I was like how am I going to introduce this I, like I despise that moment mm-hmm. and so we would shut down twice a year there to go do internships because the weather would get so bad or externships. And so I ended up doing mine at a resort in Georgia called Sea Island, Mm -hmm. about five hours from where I was previously, so closer to my family. 
and I went down there and for a hotel, it was just a very uh, progressive hotel. Yeah. And a, a very talented cast of chefs. Yeah. And one day I told these guys I wanted to work at the French Laundry and I was expecting the same response. Just and, laughter and ridicule. Yeah. Yeah. And the chef was like, good, you should. Yeah. And you could make it there too if you wanted to. That's awesome. And so, That's what you need. You know, it that motivates you. Um, and also, the fucking guy who said you couldn't do it motivated you. you know? 100%. And that, it's crazy how that both of those things motivate you. Because I've had chefs tell me, you can't cook, you can't season, you'll never be the, a chef. You know what I mean? And I don't know if it's because they've been told those things. Because I think that that's why they, they say those things. Um, but it just it just made me so angry that it made me want to be better than them, you know. And I don't know if that's the right way to motivate somebody, but God damn it, it's motivating. Yeah, you, you know? know. I don't know if it's the right way or not. And the way I look at it is it's like we don't really allow anything like that in Truffle Shuffle because ultimately if that was the right way to motivate people, we would still want to work for those people. Exactly. You I know. Hear you. Yeah. Like if that if there was some sort of gem in that, we would still go back and try to we would still today both of us would be working for those people. Exactly. You know? Yeah. But it also you know you also need that kind of devil's advocate at times. So I don't know what it is. I I don't know what the right way to consistently motivate people is. Mm-hmm. I just know Chef Perry sucked. Yeah. Fuck you, Chef Perry. All right, wherever you are. And so I went to – basically, I go down to Georgia. These guys, really cool what they're doing. They have an apprenticeship program. Yeah. You, a lot of young guys, a lot really cool. And um, I went to the chef, and I asked if I could join the apprenticeship program down there. And so he told me that I could join, but I needed to have a conversation with Chef Barry and let him know that I was going to work at Sea Island. Yeah. Have a face to face conversation, and at this point, I had taken that truck that I had and packed everything in it with the goal of never coming back to New Hampshire. Yeah, and so I, I finished out my externship program and then drove all the way back up to New Hampshire. And then it took me three months to work up the courage to tell Chef Barry that I wanted to go back to Georgia, and then I eventually did. And it was the easiest conversation of my life. He's like, "Okay, great. Trisha has the paperwork. Just fill it out." Yeah, and I was like. That's it. <laughs> relief, I, relief, though, you know. Oh yeah, you know, I'm Can like every on. every day thinking about it, you know, like how am I going to tell this guy today? Yeah. Well, you got it done, and so you're in this environment with these people that you know. You tell them I want to work for Thomas Keller, and they said, "Fuck yeah, let's do it." So what happens then? So I go back to Georgia, um, end up working there for about four years total. Yeah, and. Finished my apprenticeship program, graduated the apprenticeship program. Um, loved working there. A lot of really good experience, you know. And at this point, I, you know, I, I had a lot to learn, but I still, I, I had built like the kitchen chops, you know. Yeah, yeah, knew sure. how to use knives, knew how to work long days in the kitchen, knew how to fire things. And move and not burn anyone. And yeah. Yeah. Work safely. Mm-hmm. Fuck yeah. So you had the chops and then... So go down there, work for four years, finish your apprenticeship program, get to the end of it. They offered me, you know, a very good position. And ultimately, I was like, listen, my dream is to work at the French Laundry. I've never, at this stage, I was about 20, right? 20, 21. I had never even seen a Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. You know? Never been in one, never seen one. You he, he, you hear about you, it, yeah. Yeah, you hear about the apricots and the seps and the different ingredients that you don't get in Georgia. Yeah. You know, our truffles were truffle peelings in yeah. a can, you know, and those were awesome. You yeah, know? Exactly. yeah, for sure. I remember like opening things like that and being like, yeah, baby, we're about to use these truffles right now, you know, and then the fast forward to the first day where I was, uh, when I went to go stage in Meadowood and I look over and Chef David Kinch is chopping an enormous mound of black truffles, you know, and then mind blown even further when I found out how much they actually cost. Yeah. I was like, what the fuck? This guy was rolling with like five G's on his cutting board. 
Like, that's pretty badass. Yeah. I When I got to New Hampshire, literally, because I had read so many books, right? And every time I read foie gras in a book, I never heard anyone say it. So for like three years, I thought it was foie gras. Because I I'd read about it. I had never heard anyone say it. Yeah. And so basically I get to Georgia, get, get done with my apprenticeship program, and I just asked them for two weeks. I was like, can I have two weeks to go stage at restaurants? And they're very supportive. You know, they're they're a little upset and supportive, you know. Yeah, I see. They wanted me to stay. They wanted me to work there. But they also, you know, understood. And so um, one of the chefs there, um, he didn't want me to go. And he had actually worked at the French Laundry. And so – I asked him if he would write a letter of recommendation, and so they wrote me a really nice letter of recommendation. He said he didn't have, he didn't know anyone that was still at the restaurant. What was his name? Uh, Chef David Carrier. When did he work there? So he worked there with Manilo and um, Grant Ackett's. Okay. So in Grant Ackett's cookbook, Life on the Line, he talks about taking one guy with him from the French Laundry, and that was the chef that I worked for in Georgia. Oh, okay. He talks wow. about there's this one guy that literally used to sweat while turning artichokes. Yeah. He would do it so fast. And that was Chef David. And so I worked for Chef David. And he came in about two years of me being at Sea Island. And so an incredible chef. I love all those guys a lot. And um, But they, they you know, they, they, would, they did not pick up the phone and call – over to the French Laundry for me to just roll up, you know? And so I still had to figure that part out on my own. And so they gave me the two weeks off. It was the first two weeks I had ever taken in my career at this point. Yeah. And I just hit up Craigslist, and I lined up 11 stages in 14 days. 11 stages. 11 stages, yeah. And so I had a couple of days open for the French Laundry, and no matter what I did, nobody would answer. Yeah. Were you driving? Were you flying? So I flew out and then rented okay, a car. Okay, gotcha. So all California stages. All California, okay, yeah. Gotcha. All in San Francisco. And so first day was SPQR. Okay. Awesome restaurant. Really good culture. Really cool guys. Mm-hmm. Um, next day was Acarello. Okay. And then Alexander Steakhouse. Mm-hmm. Che TJ was in there. Oh, shit. Um, Meadowood. Costa stomping grounds. Yeah. Back in the day, Shea TJ. So I worked at Shea TJ and... Hold up, this Meadowood stage is very infamous. Yeah. We hear about it. Got yeah, I bet. employees there. So you were the guy that crashed the car, right? You crashed your car after the stage was over. Am I right? Uh, I think it was... No, it wasn't even... I didn't even get the benefit of being after the stage was over. It was the <laughs> second to last day. Okay, got you. Okay. Yeah. So you stashed for three days? Yeah. Okay. And then on the second day? Uh, second day, so the Meadowood stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, at Meadowood. And so luckily I staged at Meadowood after I landed this thing at the French Laundry. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So I'm at Meadowood. A really good friend, Ian Karen, set up this stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really excited. Honestly, I love the video they had online. Dude, so, that's what that's what inspired me. I was like, "What? <laughs> I'm going there tomorrow." Yeah. You know? And the way they did the menu format, right? Yeah, no menu. That was like, I was like, "What?" Yeah. Like, yeah. So I was like, "I gotta go check this out." And so, you know, I get there and again have no understanding of Michelin star <laughs> cuisine, right? And the first thing that they asked me to do. Was juice all these vegetables for like a vegetable jerky for the bar, right? Uh huh. And so it was like peppers, carrots, and something else. Um, and legitimately, I had never juiced anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like yeah. I never used like vegetable juice. You never in a, used the champion juicer. Never used the champion juicer. I had only at the balsams. I made. You know, it's funny. We probably used the same juicer. Yeah. And so, with that juicer, yeah, right. 
so the way if anyone doesn't know the way you're supposed to juice stuff is you like if you're making carrot juice you juice the carrots and then you have the carrot juice and then that's that project and then if you're juice now if you're juicing red pepper juice you clean the juicer and go into the red pepper juice and so the first project that uh, John gave me Chef John was to juice these Chef vegetables Johnny gave you the job yeah that must have been when he was still on the line yeah yeah oh, okay and so I juice all the vegetables together. Ah. Oh. Yeah, first project. <laughs> <laughs> and don't even know I did anything wrong. You yeah. know, I'm like, all right, I got it done. Here it is. And he's like, is it, did you juice everything together? I was like, yes. He's like, all right. And that was the moment where I'm pretty sure they just gave up on me. They're like, yeah. this guy's not Like, this work. guy doesn't have it. <laughs> and so... You know, I did some more projects. At one point, even at Meadowood, I I was julienning the uh, um, sunflower petals. Oh yeah, baby! And you know, I just bought. That new- is one of the hardest things to do. That's one of those things that, like, you know, because I got there after eight years of cooking, right? So I'm, here I am. I'm like, yeah, man, I got my, my knife skills are good. It like really just tells you that your knife skills are terrible. And you're like, these little sunflower petals are better than me right now. <laughs> you're like sitting in that little room in the refrigerated room. You're like, what am I doing? It's a dope. It's a dope dish, though. Yeah, it's a sick dish. And I mean, what? Like, I was able to, you know, do the 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 chilled pasta with sunflower XO, and that's all, you know, because I learned to work with sunflowers from mm-hmm. Chef Costa. You mm-hmm. know what I'm um, and so, so you, you juice all this together. You, those sunflower petals? So I'm doing the sunflower petals, slice part of my finger off. Oh. Uh, right. And again, I saw it. So I cover it up, go to the bathroom, get it fixed up. There's a server in the bathroom. Ah. Uh, he comes back to the kitchen. He's like, yo, there's this guy bleeding everywhere in your bathroom right now. Yeah. Come back into the kitchen. Everyone's staring at me. Right. This is day two. Right. <laughs> And I'm like, the stash from I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> and then that night, basically, uh, the way Meadowood works is they like valet park your car, yeah, right. Or maybe that's how I thought it worked. But basically, I rolled up and they took my car, parked it somewhere else, and then we got done at the end of the night, and it was kind of like a find your car type thing, yeah. And so. It ended up being all the way at the top of the hill, right? And what I do want to say is that at Meadowood, they don't have curbs, no. right? There are There's no straight boulders. Straight boulders, right? And so, which is you know, you, for the the clientele that comes to Meadowood, they probably don't need curbs, right? And so, as I'm coming down this hill, there was like a broken off piece of boulder, right? That yeah. Uh, basically, I'm coming down the hill, it catches my wheel, and then takes me, and I smash directly into the rest of the boulders. <laughs> and I'm doing one of these <laughs> in this, this uh, like, really nice Mustang rental car that I had. Oh, you even rented a car to look the part. Like, fuck yeah. And I get to the end of the hill, the entire bumper is underneath the car. Oh. And then, no joke, every single cook then drives by me, <laughs> just staring at me. And at this point, you're like, I need help. At this point, I'm like, Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm not getting the job, guys. I'm n- not already getting the French laundry joint, so you're good. Well, I'm, I knew I was not getting a job at yeah. Meadowood. <laughs> and I also knew, like, the, the level of cuisine, even if I got a job, I would have got fired in a couple weeks, yeah. you know? Well, I remember, I remember uh, after a while, of, you know, you started Truffle Shuffle. And I was like, yeah, my boy Jason started Truffle Shuffle. He's like, I know that guy. And I'm like, at this point, I had already heard this story. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> I just walked away. I, was like, I, can't, I can't let him remember that it was him. <laughs> That's so funny. So good on you for fucking finishing your stages, even though you got a job. That like that's commendable, man. Nobody does that, you know. Yeah, I put um, the bumper back in the, but I ripped the bumper off, put it in the back of the car, and I took my phone out of a cup of coffee, ooh, and then I hooked it to the stereo, and it through that it played the navigation, 
And somehow, and this has happened to a lot of people that come up to Napa Dessage. You're looking at, like, for a hotel on Hotels.com, and it says Santa Rosa is, like, six miles away. Yeah, but, but it's 45 minutes. Yeah. So I'm of saying... the windiest, most dangerous yes. roads. So, yeah, so I drive that home <laughs> with a wrecked car <laughs> while only, but only listening to, because the screen was dead, only listening to the navigation yeah. talk to me. Which cuts out halfway on yes. the mountain. Yeah. Wow, not a good day. No. But okay, it's fine. So, French Laundry, Meadowood, where else? Um, and then Alexandra Steakhouse. Okay, gotcha. SBQR, Aquarello. Yeah, and so maybe not 11 sizes, 11 days lined up. 11 days lined up, gotcha. Yeah. So multiple day sizes, okay. And all these places, you were you willing to work there, or did you say the laundry is where I, where I want to be? So, honestly, you know, I mean, coming out... Um, Coming out from Georgia and the hotel that we worked at, you know, it was a really high standards. Yeah. So I came out and I was, on some levels, I was impressed at, like, you know, how far I had come. And first thing, like, I guess I didn't really understand, I didn't understand at the time what one Michelin star meant. Yeah. You know? And so I came out and SPQR was awesome. The chef was so cool there. Akaroa was incredible. Suzette Gresham was so awesome. There was no way it was going to work at Meadowood. Um, incredible restaurant, though. And then, um, you know, Alexander Steakhouse wasn't really my style. And then Che TJ was just kind of a smaller kitchen, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the French Laundry just had the magic for me, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you walk in for your stage. Um, and what do you remember? Like, what, what was that like? this place that you had held so high in your mind, you know, and you're finally there. Yeah. So everywhere I had lined up that, you know, got it lined up the French laundry, nobody would respond to me. Mm-hmm. And so the one thing that chef David did tell me before I came out, he's like, you have to do something big to get their attention. Yeah. And so before I left, I was at Staples. Yeah. Getting my resume printed. Right. And when I went to get it picked up at Staples, they're, they have this giant printer. Yeah. And so I get my resume. I look at this giant printer, and I'm like, can you print this this resume out on there? Yeah. And the guy at Staples was like, what? I was like, can you print my resume out on that printer? And he's like, yeah. And so I print, and then this is my chef saying I have to do something big to get their attention. Right. So I printed a life-size version of my resume like like you like it would fit on a bed <laughs> how did you drive this thing to fucking yaville so i i took it with me on the plane right it rolled up in a tube and it fit in the coat rack on the plane okay right and then uh i put it in the back of this mustang and so basically i'm so i have this life side version of my resume i have my little resume i have a suit and then i had this back that I had bought. Resume. <laughs> yeah. For for all you who are out there, you all have little resumes. Right? <laughs> Eight by eleven, little. And my thought process at the time was like, not that I had done anything impressive, right? Which I thought I did, but I hadn't. You know. Yeah. I got like named like employee of the year at this resort, and it was you know it was a it was a twenty star resort, really nice place, um, but truly like nothing special. Yeah. And so. My thought process, honestly, was like, if they kick me out, I'll leave them with this, and someone will look at this. Yeah, you for know? sure. Someone has to look at that. And they'll either be like, this guy's a total jackass, or maybe we should give him a call. Yeah. So, I did not... I uh, There's been a couple of people that tried to get a job at the laundry by, like, touting themselves, you know? Yeah. Like, one time, this, this kid sent in... Uh, this is pretty funny. This kid sent in – the kid sent a chef jacket, the French Laundry chef jacket to Chef David with his name on it. Uh-huh. Like straight out of culinary school, right? And he went and bought a chef jacket and had the French Laundry embroidered and then his name and then sent it in. Uh-huh. And we thought that was the funniest thing in the world. We're like, 
what if they hire him and then on his first day, because only sous chefs have their name on the jacket at the yeah, laundry. Yeah. Like first day is like, all right, you're going to work the pass with Chef David. And that was one of those like internal jokes at the kitchen that we literally laughed at for like 10 hours. Yeah. Like, <laughs> imagining a culinary intern working with Chef David on his, like running the pass his very first day. <laughs> And did that kid sus? No, they did not call him back, nothing. So I wasn't trying to do that, right? Uh-huh. I, I wasn't trying to say that I really had anything impressive. I just wanted an opportunity to work hard. Yeah. And so basically I, I'm in California, right? Back up a couple of days from Meadowood. In California, I'm at um, SPQR the first day. I literally got off the plane, went to the restaurant. Next day, woke up, and I had about four hours before I had to be at the restaurant. And truly, I... Uh, went to the mirror, looked at myself, and I said, "Either you are gonna make, either you're gonna make a decision, or you're gonna regret this for the rest of your life." Yeah. And I put on this suit that I had. I put on, I got this backpack. I grabbed both resumes, the big resume and the little resume, mm-hmm. and I started driving to Napa. Yeah. And it took me about an hour to get up there. Yeah. And when I got to Napa, I was so blown away. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Like- and. There's nothing like that in Georgia, Hell right? No. Or Florida. And I turned into Yountville. I get on the Washington Street. Yeah. And I knew the French Laundry was on 6640 Washington Street. So once I'm on Washington Street, then literally, like, anxiety, like, I have never experienced creeps in. Yeah. And so I start driving down the road, right, in this insane level of anxiety hits me and if you don't know if you have never been there before every building looks like it could be the french one yeah <laughs> you know even the bank i'm like oh yeah this be a nice restaurant <laughs> <laughs> and so i see this place and i'm like oh my okay that's not it that's not it the next place i'm like oh okay that's not it and then eventually i see the french laundry and you know all this culmination like getting ready for this point in my life and Something in my head, I was like, I'm, I'm not ready. Yeah. And I keep driving the car. And I keep driving the car, and, you know, I call my mom, I tell her, and I go into this, I stop, I pull into the spot called Ranch Market. Yeah, yeah. And I walk in there, and I walked in there to get a toothbrush and toothpaste, razor and a shaving cream. Yeah. And even though I had just brushed my teeth and shaved like an hour ago. Yeah. And when I walk in, I see all the wine, right? Yeah. And I had never seen – I'd never seen that much wine in a little store like that, you know? Yeah. Because that doesn't happen in Georgia. Yeah. And so I walk over there. I start look, looking at the wine, and there's one bottle. It was Schaefer Relentless, and it was $94. And at the time, I had $110 in my bank, and I still had, like – you know, five days to be in California. Yeah. And so maybe I had, maybe I had like 150, right? Yeah. And so I was like, fuck it. And I bought the bottle of wine, brushed my teeth, shaved, got back in the car, started driving back to the French Laundry, gave myself a pep talk, got ready to do whatever it took to get a job there, punched the mirror out of my little car, and then parked. Walked up to the restaurant. When I got to the restaurant, there was three doors. The main door, the main blue door. Mm-hmm. A door that I could clearly see led to the kitchen. Yeah. And then a door that I now realized was just like a shed, right? Yeah. And at the time, there's a there's a YouTube video of Timothy Hollingsworth talking about how he got his job at the laundry. Yeah. And he says that he went up and gave his resume to the hostess. Yeah. And so I was like... All right, I'll go in, I'll open the blue door, I'll give my resume to the hostess. And I, I, at this point, I just have the bottle of wine and the little resume. The big resume is backup plan. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so, because again, I wasn't trying to like, you know, I was literally just trying to make sure I got someone's attention. And I go to open up the blue door, the famous blue door, and it's locked. Oh. And so then my next option is a door that leads directly to the kitchen. The kitchen, yeah. And I'm like, all right. It's now or never, baby. 
And so I started walking towards that door, right? And I opened the door up, opened the door up. And you can imagine like the visual, right? Busy restaurant at the French Laundry, the kitchen, like everything's white. All the chefs, they have their blue aprons, white chef jackets. The, the, the floors are white. Everything is so clean. Mm-hmm. Everyone's hair slicked back, right? No one, no chefs don't look like that in Georgia, right? Oh, hell no. You know? Everyone looks super professional, and so I walk in, I open the door, the server walks past me, and my gaze follows her, and then she walks away, and then directly in front of me, within three feet, right, is Chef David Breeden, who is the chef de cuisine of the French Laundry. Yes. And whose name was on the resume, right? So I, I wrote it to Chef David Breeden. Yeah. And so I'm holding that in my hand, I'm holding the bottle of wine, I look at Chef David, and I said, Chef, if you have a moment of time, I would like to chat with you. And he looks at me. He looks me up and down. And he says, absolutely, follow me this way. And in my head, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah like, I'm like, holy shit. And we go outside, sit down at this table. I put the resume down to make sure he sees his name. And then I put the bottle of wine down to make sure he saw where it said relentless. And he sees that. I'm in a suit, right? And he's like, you can just tell in his head. He's like, who is this kid? Yeah. You know? And I was like, chef, I know you're very busy. I'm out here staging for two weeks. I'm an apprentice. I just graduated from, you know, Sea Island Resorts. Yeah. And I just want to see if there would be an opportunity to work, to stage at the French Laundry for a day. Yeah. And it has made such an impact on my career thus far. And I would love to spend some time here. I'm just looking for an opportunity to work hard. Yeah. And we literally chatted for like 45 minutes. And he asked me about Georgia. He asked me about, you know, when towards the end of my time at Georgia, I w- was running the breakfast restaurant there. Yeah. And so he was really impressed with my – he just – he he told me this later, but he was like, oh, this guy – if this guy can cook eggs for 300 people, I can get him to cook fish or whatever, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, And so, you know, answered every question. And what I didn't know at the time was that the there's kind of three chefs I worked with. There's three or four chefs I worked with at Sea Island. One was Chef David, David Carrier, uh-huh. who was Grant Ackett's uh, – sous chef at one point yeah another was a guy named daniel zeal who worked under a chef named scott crawford okay now scott crawford was actually chef david breeden's chef at the woodlands back in tennessee whoa and i didn't know that at the time but chef david put that together and so uh he put that together and i think that's what sparked just enough curiosity yeah to continue talking to me uh-huh. and not just you know i mean he was a very busy chef you Fuck know yeah and so this is lunch service right this is lunch this service point, yeah. and honestly i learned later that it wasn't it was his day off he wasn't even supposed to be there that day and so it just worked out perfectly yeah. you know and so we had this conversation we could end the conversation and he was like do you have black socks? Yes, chef. Black pants? Yes, chef. White t-shirt? Yes, chef. Sharp knives? Yes, chef. I was like, okay. Be here Sunday at noon, the gold door in the back. Yeah. And I was like, yes, chef. And so I show up Sunday at noon, gold door in the back. At the time, honestly, I thought he was messing with me. I was like, what restaurant has a gold door? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and why would they put the gold door in the back? <laughs> <laughs> and so truly, I was like, all right, well, this sucks. Yeah. I'm getting pumped. Yeah. You know? And I show up. There's a gold door in the back. And I start walking towards it. And there's this other guy, tall, skinny looking guy, glasses, basically shaved head. Yeah. And he's like running towards the door with a Lex hand full of mise en place, right? Yeah. And you could tell it was it was very organized, you know? Yeah. But 
you could tell that at no point had he thought about opening the door. Yeah. Right? And so I reach forward and I open the door. And then he, like, notices me. And he's like, oh, thanks. And then I was like, hi, I'm Jason. I'm here for Tassage. And that actually, the first person that I ever saw at the French Laundry after I talked to Chef David was Tyler. Whoa, Tyler Vorce. Yeah. He's from episode one. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Is that, what a, it couldn't be a better person to be the first person you met at the French Laundry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, you meet him, and then... He went and, you know, got Chef, and then I saw her that day, and then at the end of the day, Chef David told me to give him a call when I got back to Georgia. Yeah. Gave him a call when I got back to Georgia, and he offered me a position. Very cool. And then uh, at this point, is there any lag in you going back, or did you just get on a plane and go right back? He scheduled it three months out. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you had time to get your shit together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so he scheduled it three months out, and um, this was before any of the renovations or anything, so they had a... There was, like, no turnover at the restaurant, you know? Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tyler had been there four years. Every, every single person that I talked to had been there minimum of four years. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I was very fortunate to get a position there. Yeah. And, you know, I called my mom. I told my mom. You know, she started crying. and then Of course, man. At this point, she's sending you clippings of Thomas Keller. And, you know, that must have been a proud day for her. And so I had three months. I went back to work. I got another, another job. Yeah. And for three months, I was, I was terrified at the oppor- at like the potential of like, um, I don't know, like like. I missed my flight or something. Yeah. And like, I don't you have break enough. Your leg, and then you're like, I can't. You know. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, was so scared of not having enough money in the bank to cover anything. So for three months, I I got. Two jobs, and I worked, it came out to around 100 hours a week, mm-hmm. and I did that for three months straight, and then got to the end of it, and honestly, I ended up in the hospital, because my body started shutting down. Yeah. You work so much sometimes, your body's just like, nah, we're not doing this anymore. Yeah, and so one night, I went to the ER, my throat started closing up, I got yeah. rashes, and apparently, if you work that much, it's the same thing as having like a, like a like an autoimmune disease attack Whoa. where your body can't fight off little like uh, viruses and things like that. Yeah. And so I uh, took a couple of days off and then flew to California. Start your, start your life. Now, did you get put up somewhere? Did you have an apartment? So I flew to California. Yeah. Um, I, after I staged, I started looking on Craigslist, found an apartment and Made a deal with this guy to, it was 700 bucks a month. I was like, yo, I'm going to be out here this day, right? Yeah. And again, I didn't have anything lined up. I was like, I'm going to be out here this day. And um, he agreed to hold the posi- hold the spot for me. And so got out there, got this apartment. I'm unpacking my bags. I put the suitcases in the closet. I look at the shelf. Yeah. And written underneath this self shelf was a, a note and it said something like a like a Yamville's been great, now off to Chicago, D C and it was a note from the chef I worked for in Georgia. From when he lived in that apartment when he worked at the French laundry. What the fuck? Yeah. That is crazy. But once again, we talk about that shit on this show all the time. Legacy. Yeah. Just, you know, people knowing people through hard work and diligence. That's that's cool, man. Hell yeah. So then you knew that was a sign right there. You're like, I'm right I'm right where I need to be. It was crazy. You know? So you're working at the laundry and um, you start off as Comey? Start off as a Comey, okay. yeah. Okay, got you. And then how long did it take you to kind of get up, get out of there, get on the line? So, you know, the Comey position was, in terms of, like, difficulty, was easier than, you know, the stuff we were doing at Sea Island. Because uh-huh. it was just simpler, you know? Uh-huh. At Sea Island, I would work, like, three services a day. We just worked all the time. Yeah. And so, I was Comey for about a month, 
and then I moved up to PM Comey. I, was, I did that for a month. And then PM Comey, like Comey at the laundry is you do all like the little projects. And then PM Comey, you do kind of like pastas and eggshells and things like that. Uh-huh. And then the only job I didn't want to do there was to become the fish butcher. Okay. What's and that? There was another gentleman doing it at the time. And it was a position where you were, you worked directly with the chef de cuisine at the restaurant. Uh-huh. And then you the manage five to six thousand dollars worth of product a day. Yeah. You know? And I was like, the fastest way I'll probably get fired, you know what I mean, is the fact that I don't know how to cut fish. Yeah. And if I start cutting fish in a restaurant with you know, like it the fish costs four hundred dollars and you make one cut wrong. That might be a twenty dollar cut, you yeah. know. And I'm like, well, that's one position I don't want to do. And then you, it's not like you work with a sous chef and who's a little maybe a little more lenient. You're working directly with the chef de cuisine in the restaurant. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, I'll do anything. I don't want to be the fish butcher. And after they been there for two months, Chef David asked me if I would be the fish butcher. <laughs> and what do you say? Of course, yes, chef. I said yes, chef. <laughs> he said good it. answer, and yeah. I said. Thank you, chef. And then, honestly, he unbelievably took me under his wing. Every Saturday, we would cut fish together. Yeah. And he was a master butcher. And so, I cut fish together with him every Saturday for like a year. And truly, cutting fish at that restaurant allowed me to honestly learn my, like, philosophy of, like, how I do things in life. Yeah. And so, when I was cutting fish... I mean, it was unbelievably difficult to start, you know. I was so slow at the oysters. I would come in at 3 a.m. and start – I would stand on a milk crate and start shucking the oysters. And I had to stand on a milk crate because they were cleaning the kitchen, Uh, the overnight cleaners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'd stand on this milk crate and I'd start shucking these oysters. But then the only place I could stand was next to the door, and then it would be winter. And so the door would be open because they got to get all the water out and – you're shucking oysters, and the oysters are cold. So for like three, four hours, my hands would just be, you know, I'd just be shucking these unbelievably cold oysters. <laughs> and on average, that project should take like an hour. Yeah. But I was just so slow at it. So yeah. I just kept co- trying to come in as early as possible. And it took a, it took me a long time to really get up to speed on everything, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, cutting fish. Shucking the oysters. I'm the same way, man. It always took me just a little bit more effort to, like, get there. Yeah. You know, and then you look around, and the guys that are just, like, doing it like it's so easy, you're like, God damn. Yeah, you totally. Know? Yeah. I, I felt that way my whole career, man. It's always like, I'm behind, and I need to come in earlier and push harder in order to be able to be as good as these guys around me. Mm-hmm. But that's how you know you're in a good spot because everybody's better than you. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, I'm gonna make sure that I'm as good as these guys someday. You know, it's very cool. So you're cutting fish, and um, you know you're with Dave and Brady for that year. Uh, what are you doing after that? Did you move up after that? Yeah, so I got an opportunity to go on the line. Okay. And what's the first station on the hotline you were on? So the first station I worked was Garbage. Okay. And so. Got on the line, worked garbage there. When I got on the line was when we were in the temp kitchen. Yeah. And so as fish butcher, I actually got the core award for the restaurant, which was really cool. That's cool. And so there's a time where, you know, we had just moved kitchens and some people were traveling and whatnot. So we're short staffed and I got an opportunity to kind of like uh, help the sous chefs lead the Comey team. Oh, yeah. And it was really cool and I got recognized by Chef Keller and Chef David Breeden and Michael Manillo. And it was, you know, it, it meant a lot to me that they would give me that reward, you know? Yeah. Um, and so moved from there onto the line. Yeah. And then again, you know, it's kind of like, you know, back to, you know, like being at the balsams, cutting that onion, like, once I got in the line, at, at this point, I, I was very well-versed at I had been fish butcher for over two years. And so I was very well-versed at, like, the French Laundry's way of doing things. Yeah. You know? But the kind of issue that I dealt with once I got onto the line, it wasn't that bad on the 
Garmage. But then I moved to Canapé, and then I moved to Fish. And I, wor- I worked at Fish Station for a long time. I was on the Fish Station for around another... I was at the French Laundry for a total of four years. And I worked at Fish Station for like a year and a half. And when I was on the hotline, kind of the biggest thing I worked with, worked on there, was just like being able to focus properly. Yeah. And so I was always kind of like that spaz cook, you know? Yeah. And so a very bad ADD. Hurricane. Uh, you know, you're kind of like going somewhere. You're like, why, why am I here? Yeah. The, it Kind of what I figured out is I can focus for 50 seconds out of a minute. Yeah. But then there's 10 seconds where I literally, I don't even know what I think about, you know? Yeah. And so in certain things that works great, you know, but then like working the line where you're working with hot food, sometimes not the best. Yeah. And so my whole goal when I was at the French Laundry was to be a calm cook. Yeah. To figure out how to handle anything and be as calm as possible. And so while I was at the French Laundry, I actually started studying Zen Buddhism. Yeah. And so every Thursday, I would go to this temple, and I would stay the night there, and I'd learn how to meditate. And it's the same temple that Steve Jobs used to go to. That's in SF? It's in uh, just outside in Marin. In Marin. Okay. What's it called? Uh, Green Gulch. Green Gulch. Got you. And so I read Steve Jobs' biography, and in that, he talks about a book called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Uh Uh-huh. That was written by uh, a Zen monk called Shunru Suzuki. And Shunru Suzuki started um, the San Francisco Zen Center. Okay. And so Steve Jobs said that this book changed his life. Uh huh. And I said, if there's a book that changed Steve Jobs' life, then I should probably read, read this. That book, yeah. And so I read it. And I went down, and I went to this temple, and I ended up meeting one lady named Emma Heller, who was, uh, after the Dharma talk, she was selling bread, and I was asking about the bread, and I told her I was with French Laundry, she should, she actually was in charge of the garden, uh-huh. and she's actually, if you, there's a couple, there's an article about her, where it's the top ten women in Buddhism to know of all time, mm-hmm. like, since the start of Buddhism, and she's on that list. And then she ended up being my Zen teacher. Whoa. So Zen teacher, what does that entail? So there's a formal process where you um, take the Buddhist, the Zen vows, mm-hmm. vows, and that's kind of a, a formal process. And you, while you take the vows, you sew a rakasu. Yeah. Right? And the rakasu is this little, it's like a, it's the start of a robe. Okay. And so all monks that you see, the robes at their end entail what level of Buddhism they're at. Okay. Right? And they sew those. And so as they're training for that next level, they're literally sewing their robes. Okay. And sewing their, the knowledge and the, the seeds of what they're um, trying to learn. Okay. And so that's the formal practice. And then kind of the practice that I went through and am still going through yeah. was I would go down to this temple on Thursday, on Wednesday, and I would stay the night. I would help them clean dishes. I would stay the night. I'd wake up in the morning. I would meditate, and then I'd go down to the garden, and I'd work with this lady, Emila, and she just encouraged me to study study the mind, you know, like study how your mind works. Yeah. And... Where I think, honestly, I made a breakthrough was being able to look at how I talk to myself. And if I can say if there's ever been anything in my life, it was understanding truly how you talk to yourself. And so, like, even as we're doing this podcast and I am talking to you, yeah, you are talking to yourself twice as fast as I'm talking to you. Oh, yeah. And so everything you go through out in life, you are talking to yourself. And how that voice talks to yourself will dictate a lot of how you feel about yourself. For sure. And if you – what I learned was I never spoke poorly to myself, but I would mimic the voices of the people that I thought would be angry with me. 
Okay. So literally, I would have Tyler's voice in my head. I would have Chef David's voice in my head. And when I learned that about myself, and I changed that voice from them roasting me about something to my voice saying, hey, Jason, it's okay. We yeah. will figure this out. It's fine. Yeah. Then the the last year I was at the laundry was, you know, honestly the most proud I've ever been of myself as a chef. Yeah. And it felt like I could go into service every day and, you know, knock it out of the park no matter what. Yeah. That's a, that's cool, man. That's a, that's self growth like a mother. It, it took a, a long time. It took a long time to get there, you know. Yeah. And the more things that you have in your life where shit happened to you that you can't explain why it happened, yeah. you know. A lot, you know, a lot of a lot of kids come from broken homes, you know. Yeah. And when you come from a broken home and things happen and you really can't explain it, the more erratic that voice will get you know yeah, for sure i mean I, I make it a point to stay right in the middle you know i'm i'm gonna be nice to myself but i'm also gonna be you know hold myself to a certain standard so every morning i wake up i look myself in the mirror and i go you're fucking amazing you're a champion now shut the fuck up you know what i mean it's like humble yourself a little <clears> bit <throat> before you walk out that door and that always kind of helps me, you know, get into the mindset of having to be this, you know, leader to my cooks and having to make decisions that affect what people are ultimately putting into their bodies, you know, yeah. which is food. So um, that's something that you learn, you know, after you're done being the erratic cook, which is it was crazy the way you put it. But it's like, yeah, you go from that being crazy and kind of like, you know, not not really thinking in a focused matter to to going home and being like, I need to like think about this on another level than just like when I get to work, you know. And once you start doing that, you start growing internally. And um, I'm super interested in that because you've told me about the Zen Garden before. And uh, yeah, we'll go down there. Yeah, Hell yeah. Let's go. Hell yeah. Um, Can anybody go? It's open to the public. Okay, it's a little weird now, but but yeah, they I know, I know. they ha- they literally have probably like fifty million dollars worth of land that was okay. given them to them by the guy that started Kodak. Uh huh. And the only rule was that you have to make you have to operate a farm here. Okay. And then forever, and then it has to remain open to the public. Okay. And so you can go. They have a Sunday public program. Yeah. And then they have. It's 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 a very special place because it's one of the only places in the U.S. where it's in kind of a monastery like setting, and then people live there full time. Yeah, a lot of the temples are kind of like part time throughout the U.S., but people live there full time, so you get the feeling of what it's like to meet more than just one person that spent their spent the past thirty, forty, fifty years studying the, their mind. Yeah. Now, when you say study their mind, there's is, there's processes to this, no? Like if you say you have a teacher, there's ways, right? They're telling you the ways to do it, or is it kind of like figure it out with these hints that I give you? Like what what is the teaching like? You know, in Zen, there's all sorts of different teaching. Okay. And ultimately it comes down, and I am not a Zen teacher Okay. myself, you know, but – there's there's a Zen practice where um, when you start, they give you a riddle. Yeah. And you're in, in – this is literally a riddle you'll deal with for 10, 15 years. And the whole goal is to figure out the solution to the riddle, and you have to keep coming back to the man, your master with an answer. Uh-huh. Right? Or keep coming back to the uh, top monk with an answer. And so – from what I've heard, you eventually keep going back and the Zen teacher just tells you no until you completely break down. And then after you completely break down, then they'll tell you yes. And so that's one way. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm probably butchering a lot of the terms with this. And so the other way, and, and Zen means to sit, and so it's Zen Buddhism is a Japanese sect of Buddhism, uh-huh. and it's focused on sitting meditation. And so in 
our culture today, you hear a lot about meditation, but honestly, when you go to, when you spend time at the temple, nobody really talks, nobody talks about meditation. They talk about sitting. Yeah. And then nobody, I've literally never heard anyone at that temple talk about enlightenment. They just talk about taking the time to study your own mind. And, you know, honestly, the RZA put it, the best way that I can explain it. And it's like, you go and sit with yourself for three days and you will start to hear your voice. And the next best way I could explain it is that you, you can't have a relationship. Your relationship with the outside world will only be as great as your relationship is with yourself. And so Zen is kind of a study of, First, understanding that all everyone in this world is suffering. The yeah. moment you die, the moment you're born, you start dying. Mm-hmm. You're getting, you're living your entire life to die at one point. And so, Zen is a study of life. And so, it's just it is it's a way. And I think it gets kind of bastardized. And I'm probably bastardizing right now, but I think it's very difficult. I think it honestly creates complications for people when they try to study Zen while also living a busy life. Yeah. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, I should have meditated for 20 minutes. And then there's actually studies done of like meditation apps and things like that are maybe like 2% as effective as like true meditation. Yeah. Sitting down with yourself and just, that's it. For example, in, when you sit in the Zendo, you don't close your eyes. Okay. You face the wall and your eyes are, at the floor and the whole thing is maintaining a certain posture and as you're sitting there you're just focusing okay my back hurts a little bit or you break the posture and then you just bring the discipline back and every time you bring the discipline back right like you you sit with your hands like this and if you soft a little right in some temples that um there's actually someone in the zendo that goes and hits your back with a stick and it brings you back and so you're always coming back to the moment. So your mind's over here, right? And you notice something's wrong, you come back to the moment. And so it's kind of just a practice of living in the now. Whoa. Well, we just went down a huge rabbit hole from the French Laundry, but that's okay. Yeah. We're getting to know Jason. Um, but let's go back to the restaurant. So you're... About to come to the end of your time, no? Yeah, so, you know, I've been there about four years, Mm -hmm. and I kind of had a decision to make. You know, either I stay at the restaurant, I really wanted to work the meat station, and then potentially move on to being a sous chef at the restaurant. Yeah. And so, um, I started looking at what other potential options there could be, you know, and at this time, I'm broke. Yeah. And, uh... I find this random ad on Craigslist and it was for a job in Wyoming for like two months and it was going to pay more money than I had ever had in my bank account, you know, and I was looking for a chef and a chef's assistant. And at this time I had started dating who is now my wife, Sarah. Shout out to Sarah because she made this delicious banana bread here and I haven't offered you any, but I am literally going to eat this whole thing. Yeah, she's awesome with that. And so it's me and Sarah, and find this ad. Responded to the ad. They sent us some pictures, showed showed Sarah the pictures. She was unbelievably pumped about the thought of us going on an adventure to Wyoming. And then got on a phone call with the guy and learned more about the position. And basically the only question this gentleman asked, his name was Mitch, was would you – or his question was do you get paid by the French Laundry? I was like, well, what do you mean? He's like, do they – does the French Laundry actually pay you money to cook there? Yeah. And I was like, yes. He's like, all right. Well, then you're hired. (laughs) And he was just trying to see if I was like just an intern, yeah, or just if a I, stage, yeah. yeah, or if I actually worked there, yeah. And so I was like, "Yes, they do." He's like, "All right, well, listen, this sounds good to me. If it sounds good to you, then I say we do it." And in 
I did, it was like a 15 minute phone call and I'm like, all right, Mitch, sounds good. Let's do it. And I agreed to take this job. Not really having any clue about anything other than I'm going to be making basically it was $10,000 a person a month. And I was like, well, that's going to hell put, yeah. Yeah. Put some money in the bank. Mm-hmm. And at the time I'm making like 12 bucks an hour, you know? Yeah. And so I agree to it. I tell Sarah she's pumped, but then now I have to leave the restaurant. Yeah. And so take a couple of days. Eventually I put my notice in. I talk to Mitch again and then uh, we tell our parents and my mom and Sarah's parents were terrified. Yeah. They're like, you're leaving the French laundry to work on a ranch in Wyoming and you think you're going to make this much money? They're like, it's a total scam. Yeah. And I get back on the phone with Mitch, and I explain it to Mitch. I'm like, I just started dating this girl. Is there any way we could meet or something, you know? And he's like, I understand. I understand. I totally understand. And so uh, he's like, what days do you have off? I tell him what days we have off. And he is like, okay, I'll, I'll get you a flight. I'll send you the details tomorrow. And I'm like, okay. Next day I get a text message from Mitch, and it's a couple of Digits and numbers, right? Mm-hmm. Letters and numbers. And I'm like, uh, what is this? Mm-hmm. And he's like, that's the tail number. And I was like, oh, shit. And so when you fly on a private jet, uh-huh. it's organized by the tail number of the plane. Whoa. And so this dude literally sent his private mm-hmm. jet to come pick me and Sarah up. <laughs> From the Napa airport. Yeah. Right? From the Napa airport. From the Napa airport. That's so convenient. And uh, went and got on got on this jet. I worked for twenty four hours straight to get all the a bunch of like a bunch of food prep to be able to cook for him out there. To do like a little tasting, you know? Yeah. Did he request a tasting or were you like, I'm just doing this? I was like, I'm just doing this. Okay. And so um Fly out there and land. Mitch and his wife pick us up, take us to this ranch. And, I mean, this is literally, like, out of a movie. You know what I mean? It's, like, 500 acres, beautiful ranch. You can house, like, 50 people there. Has, like, a full, like, a commercial kitchen. Yeah. With an outdoor, like, an outdoor, like, little restaurant that you could see up to, like, 30 people. Yeah. Wood fired pizza oven, and we're just like, where in the hell are we? Yeah, <laughs> and landed in a private jet, ended up on this ranch, and we, you know, really locked the job in, and then flew back, told our parents, and they're but they're all like, oh my god, this is like a movie. You guys got to write a book about this, <laughs> and we're like, all right, and then spent about another month at the restaurant, and then went out to Wyoming and worked this gig for Mitch. Yeah. And it turns out Mitch started a company called Super Shuttle back in the day and sold it for a few hundred million dollars. Okay. And then he, while growing Super Shuttle, he also um, had the largest fleet of taxis in America. Okay. And then when Uber and Lyft started coming out, he actually developed the software. He he bought the soft, part of the software from the government uh-huh. that's like – Let's say you're on a mission, right? You drive this person here. They have to get to here. You have to give them GPS coordinates to get to there, uh-huh. right? And so that's the same software that they that Uber and Lyft uses. Okay. But he was the first, like, civilian to use it for uh, – His taxis. No, he used it for Super Shuttle. Oh, okay. Which would pick up 10 people at the airport and take them to 10 different houses. Oh, so okay. So he mapped the entire U.S., all the roadways, everything like that, right, to use with the software. And then he actually licensed that version of the software to Uber and Lyft. Okay. And so Uber and Lyft run all of their rides off of his software. Whoa. And so I learned – he's a very quiet guy. I learned all this over and him for a period of time. And so worked for him out there. Very, he's, you know, I think he's 82. Okay. Right? And then went back to – California with the goal of honestly just saving up money, you know. I wasn't exactly sure. We had this idea of taking a trip around the world. And so 
come back, land a job with, and you know, we'll speed this part up to get to Truffle Shuffle, but basically land a job with a guy named, with, I'm not allowed to say his name, but basically he was one of the executives of Apple. Yeah. Was responsible for creating the iPhone. Oh. And I was making more money than I had ever had in my life. And the first thing that I thought to do was take that money and invest it in a business of our own. And so while I was at the French Laundry, learned about truffles, loved truffles, and honestly learned about truffles, loved truffles, and then kind of two things, you know, I saw you could work your way all the way to the top at these restaurants, but then the next thing you do, right, you're starting completely from ground zero. And one guy that I had interviewed with, I was like, well, how did you get to where you're at now? You know, I, I always ask these questions. And he's like, well, I went to college for computers and then worked at this company, became the CEO. When that company sold, I owned <coughs> a good majority of it. And I became, you know what I mean, worth a billion dollars. Yeah. And just that thought alone, I was like, how, how like, how do chefs get so screwed over in this process? Yeah. You know, they work just as hard or just as intelligent, but just because it's a slightly different business model, when you take a guy that works his way all the way to the top of the ranks, when he goes to leave, then he has to go out and raise $2 million to start a restaurant. Yeah. And then in this process, nobody has taught a chef about equity or an investment or how to run a business, you yeah. know? So then, you know, he sells a portion of the restaurant, and then by the time he opens up that restaurant, and I kept seeing this happen again and again, it almost becomes a nightmare. Yeah. And then you're trying to figure out how to, you know, raise money from investors and open a restaurant all while creating the menu or even being open and running the team. Yeah. And so it was kind of this little bit of a disconnect of seeing my dad start a business from ground zero to what it was, and then seeing how chefs aren't they don't necessarily own their businesses yeah you know and so it's just a little bit of like well why do we have to get money from other people to do money from other people for our passion you know yeah and it's like cooking is a passion restaurants are a business and so there's this kind of like inkling right and i was like well i don't know but what if what if we started a business that we could sell for a large amount of money, yeah. you know? And it was just like that thought. And so the first idea we had was to start an app to sell truffles, mm-hmm. which is a horrible idea. It would never work. <laughs> <laughs> but for about six months, I told everybody that would listen that that is what we were going to do. Yeah. And so the first thing that we did, basically I was making all this money working for this gentleman. Um, I was, I was literally bringing in around ten thousand dollars a month working mm-hmm. for him, and so after about two three months, I got this kid, and we took nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine euros. That was a legal amount you're allowed to fly with. Okay, strapped it to his chest, sent him to Italy, and he started meeting truffle hunters, and he would live with them, buy the truffles, send them back here, and then. We would just hustle them to restaurants. We would just go door to door to restaurants. We would make lists in the morning. And then I was doing this all while working for this other gentleman. Mm-hmm. You know, I was essentially his private chef. And so I would go in the morning, try to sell truffles. I'd cook lunch for him and his family. And then I would leave and say I had to go to the grocery store. And then I would try to sell more truffles. And then I would get done with dinner and then start the process all over again. And so basically for like, since I started Truffle Shuffle, I always had like two to 20 pounds of truffles in a cooler in my car and a scale and everything that I was <laughs> trying to figure out how to sell. Yeah. So you're selling these truffles out of, out of your car and then when do you when do you upgrade? When are you like, okay, this is taken off? When are you kind of realizing that like this is something that could be – could work? You know, when we started the business and just dealing with that amount of money, I mean, it, we started off and it the the 
guy that we first started it with, he got really nervous when he was out in Italy and just, de- again, just dealing with that amount of money. Yeah. And he just co- went completely AWOL. And then I had to figure out how to continue getting truffles in. And as soon as he went AWOL, we got our first order from a Michelin star restaurant. Yeah. Right? And so I had to figure out how to get these truffles in and made some connections through Instagram and then got this first beautiful shipment in. Right, sold it to our first two Michelin star restaurant, which was Ocarello. Mm-hmm. Right, and then the next like three shipments were uh, destroyed by customs, and so we lost like eight thousand dollars. How they destroy? They would come in and we would ship them through DHL, and they would land in Salt Lake City, Utah, where the customs person was. Right, and what would happen is they would just get flagged. For inspection, and they wouldn't even ever inspect it, but they would sit there for like four or five days. And by that time, by the time the truffles got to us, they were terrible. Yeah. They wouldn't put them in a cooler, right? And so that's, we learned, that's a big part of this business, just learning, you know, the logistics of shipping it, right? Yeah. So you want to ship it directly from where the hunters have found it to where your customs person is. That way, you can literally go down there. I mean, some days now, when we were in the height of the season, we would call our customs guy 96, 150 times a day, yeah. right? Hey, we got these shuffles coming in. You need to clear them. You need to clear them. You need to clear them. And they literally just look at them, make sure there's no dirt on them, and then clear them. That is all they do. Uh-huh. They're not even, like, checking for drugs or anything like that. They're just – and then they tape the back box back up, cleared. And so – um. This kid goes AWOL, right? Yeah. And then we start losing all these shipments of truffles. But we're still, like, pretty deep into this. You know what I mean? At this stage, we have told all these people we're starting this business. Um, at some point, Tyler came out and started saying with me. And so it's me, Tyler, and Sarah living in a 400-square-foot cottage. And in be- be before the cottage, I literally, while I was first working for this gentleman... Me and Sarah lived in a car in San Francisco, and I saved up as much money as I could, and I'd go to a bar every night and write the business plan for Truffle Shuffle. Mm -hmm. And so it'd be like, go, like, I would go there, and I'd first, like, research what is a business plan, Mm -hmm. you know, and then download it, and then read one, and then find a business plan template. And then I would input my version of what I thought Truffle Shuffle was going to be. And so we... Got that together and then got into this little cottage and started shuffle shuffled. And so we get to a point where it's very difficult to get shuffles in. And then all of a sudden we met this one guy. He likes to be referred to as the kingpin. Okay. And so he was is one of the largest importers of truffles in the United States. Mm-hmm. And it literally turns out that this guy lives one exit up from me. In Marin. Uh-huh. And so I met him through a chef, like a friend of a chef of a chef, and um, meet this gentleman, go to meet him for the first time, right? Literally get the call that the third shipment of truffles doesn't come in, get the call from this gentleman, go to meet him, and we literally meet at a Starbucks, and he's like, tells me a story. He is from war-torn Kosovo. When the war broke up, he started buying land, government land, and he has uh, government land, and he has truffle hunters on, like, payroll, Mm -hmm. right? And so he owns the land so nobody else can hunt there. And then he's able to support all these truffle hunters where he pays them an annual salary, right? Yeah. And so he's like, would you like to see some truffles, right? And I was like, yeah. Go out to the car, and this guy literally pulls out 40 pounds of white truffles. Oh, my God. In the middle of Starbucks. We're yeah, at Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's stinking up the joint. Everyone's looking over, you know what I mean? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I was like, could I buy some? He's like, yes. He's like, just pay me in 30 days. And I'm like, holy shit. And so, you know, bought some truffles. You and got then the front. 
a front yeah, man. Yeah, the front, and I was like, I never even knew that was a thing. Yeah. You know? That's awesome. And so, started buying truffles directly from him, and so basically he became our uh, importer and customs broker. Yeah. And that allowed us to go from, you know, being very close to being totally effed to having the supply we needed it when the chefs needed it. And mm-hmm. so after that, we hit kind of a turning point, And by the end of that year, we we started the business in November, right? Or we started it September 11th. And by the end of that year, 2018, we had broken $100,000 in revenue. That is amazing. And we didn't make any profit, but just the fact that we brought in $100,000 in top line revenue, we were like, this is awesome. Yeah. And it was just sheer hustle. If we couldn't sell the truffles, we literally would cold call rich people to book private dinners. You know what I mean? Like just sheer nonstop hustle. We were prepping these dinners out of this 400 square foot cottage with like a miniature oven, miniature fridge. Yeah. Like all the truffles we stored in like uh, mini fridges just stacked up on top of each other. Mm-hmm. Like Tyler lived basically on the floor. We lived on the floor, you know. And so the the little bit of – there's like you started to get a little bit of a taste of a freedom of what having your own business can do, you yeah. know. And uh, – we decided to, you know, continue Truffle Shuffle. Yeah. And ultimately, you know, we never wanted to be like truffle hustlers. Yeah. But we saw an opportunity to create something, you know, and we – it, and I think a lot of businesses start like this, you know. Like you see that I can buy this for this much and sell it for this much mm-hmm. and make a profit. Yeah. And then as you do it, you hit a point where you're like, well, in order to – grow this i need 30 more of me you know yeah so then you ask yourself well how do i grow this without 30 more of me and our answer for that was products and we're like all right well what if we if we don't have to sell it if it's on a shelf someone else will sell it right the store will sell it or whoever we just have to make it we got to get it there yeah and so we're like all right well yeah let's do products and so we launched a balinese truffle salt now this truffle salt that was a pretty cool story, man. Like, you went to to Bali, yeah, right, and you hung out with this family that makes this salt. How long were you out there? So, me and Sarah went to Bali on our honeymoon. Okay, and so we got married in March, uh huh, and 2018. 2019, now. 2019. Now. Yeah, okay, gotcha. so we got married in March, and I hope that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> And she's gonna listen. We went on our honeymoon, um, and we go on our honeymoon. We go to Bali, and we were there for about a week. And I want, I just wanted to see how salt was made. Yeah. Right. So we're in Bali. I knew that they made salt in Bali, but you can't find any information about it. There's no Balinese salt farmer has a website. Yeah. Right. Like they, they, you know, they just don't. They have, you know, touch phone or a, like, like the old Nokia cell phones. You yeah, know? yeah. So no computers. None of them have a website. So, but what we did find is that in a little village called Kusamba, that they have had like previous salt farm tours there. So mm-hmm. we're like, okay. And so we're about halfway through this thing. We decided to rent some scooters, and we drive up to Kusamba. We get to Kusamba, and we're literally in the middle of Kusamba. And the, it's not a tourist town. There's no tourists there, right? And so we're in Kusamba, stop the scooter, we're at the stoplight, and everyone is like, what are you doing here? Yeah. And I look around, and I see a sign that says, Kusamba Salt Farmer. <laughs> it was, like, taped on the side of a building, you know? And I yeah. was like, I point to the sign, and these guys are like, oh, you want to see the salt farm? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay. And take me down this road, get to the end of the road, and it's like a port for a fast boat. Yeah. So there's literally like a thousand scooters stacked up, right? And so they tell me to park the scooter, and I so I park it next to all these other scooters. 
they told me to leave the helmet with the scooter, and it was crazy. All these helmets were still on all these scooters. Like, yeah. nobody messed with anyone else's stuff there. And they take me through this beach, opens up into a clearing. In this clearing, you see, like, these bamboo trays, right? And it's all this salt drying. And as we got closer, this lady woke up. She had this pink towel on her head, came out with a blue spoon with a heaping of this sea salt, right? And so I, I'm sure they had kind of like a system for this and brings the sea salt out. And when I tasted it, it was the best salt I had ever tasted in my life. And we spent that afternoon with the family and learned about the salt farm. They showed us how they made it. And the process to make sea salt is unbelievably difficult. We won't get into it, but it takes about 30 days just to make sea salt. Yeah. You know? And they told me essentially that they, the – They've been doing this for about 60 years. The grandmother there, her name was Wernie. Her husband just recently passed away. Uh And the whole goal was to pass this salt farm on to their kids. But in the time that they've been growing this salt farm in Indonesia, they have factories. The factories produce two tons of salt a day. Yeah. And so they're making everything by hand, right? And they can produce maybe... 30 kilos a day. Uh huh. So, you know, I don't know, 0.5% or whatever that math is. And there's no way they can keep up. And so they had all this salt stacked up that a Japanese company was supposed to buy because Japan is very close to Bali. Mm -hmm. And that company never came. And so we took a little, we took just a one kilo bag of the salt home, Mm -hmm. really with. You know, we know we wanted to do a product, but I was like, I don't, you know, is it truffle salt or, Mm -hmm. you know, not really with a clear idea in mind. And when we got back here, uh, we had gotten this truffle powder and we mixed the truffle powder with the Balinese truffle salt. We mixed it together. And then when we tasted it, literally, I looked at Tyler and I told him that this would make us a million dollars. And it was just so spot on. Yeah. And so we decided to launch that as a product, and we had never launched a product before. And normally, we learned it takes companies like two years to do this. Yeah, we did not know that. So we we get we start getting everything together, but the biggest issue is we don't have any salt. And then the WhatsApp number that the family gave me, nobody will answer. Ugh. And so we literally made the decision to fly all the way back to Bali. Uh huh. This time you bring a film crew. We brought Andy yeah. and got it all on film. And honestly, when I think about it now, like, we did not have a lot of money in the bank. You know, we had no investors. Yeah. And to fly to Bali, to fly to Bali to get more salt, like, just our confidence in that back then is kind of like surreal to me now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that's like a $3,000 trip in a company that was only making like $30,000 a month. Yeah. You know? And so we go back to Bali. We get this footage. We get this salt. When we showed back up, the family had actually kept my business card on their little uh, hut. And they're like, we knew you would come back. And then we bought all the salt that they had stacked up from that Japanese company that didn't buy it. Yeah. Loaded up into this tiny little car that we had rented. I thought it was a good idea to get this little car, and it was a horrible idea. We could have easily just got a nicer car, but we got this little... I thought it looked good for the video, and it was it broke down at every turn. <laughs> it was such a bad idea. There you go. Aesthetics. We usually fuck shit up. Yeah. So how happy was this family when you went over there and brought all that salt? Dude, I mean, they were blown out of the water. Like, that's so cool. And, you know, the biggest thing that made an impact to me was I was making a joke. I was like, do the kids work on the salt farm? And so, you know, it's a grandmother, the son, another daughter. They both have spouses, and then they, there's kids. There's like six kids running around. Mm-hmm. And these kids had never seen uh, face emojis. And so 
that is one of the greatest pleasures of my entire life is showing these kids. We I held the iPhone to them, and then they would see, like, cat ears form, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, or mustaches and yeah. things like that. I literally did that with them for, like, three hours. It was the funniest <laughs> thing of my life. That's amazing. Um, and what kind of made an impact to me is I asked them. I was like, I was like, do they work on the salt farm, you know? I was like, you put them to work on the salt farm, right? And honestly, I was kind of making a joke, but I was—I honestly thought they worked on the salt farm. Yeah. And they're like, no, we work on the salt farm so they can go to school. And I was like, wow. I, I felt a little embarrassed, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. And so it, they had so much pride in making the salt that they they – this was their way of life. This was what they were contributing to the world was yeah. creating the salt. And so we've been able to continue supporting that family and we bring this salt back here, right? And we launched this as a product and we put together this whole email campaign. And throughout this whole process, I read as many books as I can get my hands on. And so at this stage, I'm reading like product launch books and marketing books and I'm trying to figure out how do we, how do we, you know, sell this, you know? Yeah. And I read this old book about like the email launch strategy, and I did I did not know that this strategy was like ten years outdated. Right, you were, you were like, I got this new fucking thing. We're gonna kill it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. You yeah, like, I mean? I... and it was a very good strategy when email was first invented. Yeah, and it was basically this like you send you keep sending these emails with a story all anticipating like a day when it's available. Yeah. Right? But nobody like nobody cares. <laughs> it, people want one email, quick copy, button to buy, right? Yeah. And so by the time we sent that last email for them to buy, we sold two jars of salt. Two jars, 40 bucks. Yeah. We had Enough for 10,000 units. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had to, we started going to stores and doing product demos in stores. And that's right. I remember I'd call you and be like, yo, we're in this uh, store right now. Hey, you try some of this shuffle salt. Yeah. I'd be like, you're talking yeah. to customers that way. It's a Bali shuffle salt. All the salt comes from a single family in Bali. It's made 20% actual truffles and a touch of mushrooms. goes great. A little goat cheese and rusted bakery crackers, and honestly, it is unbelievable on some sliced tomatoes. Damn, I we would say that like four hundred times a day. Yeah, right. And so we start doing that, and we go up to Oakville Grocery, and we start selling this salt. Right, we started selling it like a hundred jars a day, and that's when we we're like, all right, maybe we are really onto something, and uh, selling a hundred jars a day of this stuff, and then get to the point where. Um, we wanted to get in the Whole Foods. Yeah. And somehow, basically, what, and I say somehow, but a chef, Chef Phil made a connection with us to a lady named Norma at Whole Foods. And Norma became our fairy godmother. And yeah. Whole Foods has this, you know, litany of processes to get your product on the shelves. And she set us up as a caterer for the regional president's retreat. Yeah. So they were on a retreat, all the decision makers for Whole Foods, right, on a retreat. And they thought they were going to get a catered lunch. And what they got was me, Tyler, and Ian in a Whole Foods food truck at uh, Hot Island Oyster Company. Yeah. And we cooked them the best three-course truffle lunch they've ever had in their life. And we had the truffle salt on the table. We had truffle honey there. And we just pitch the product to them. And at the end of it, they're like, you guys are awesome. We're going to set you guys up to go global. Which means you go into every single store in one shot. And we were uh, we were so pumped. We literally thought we had made it as a company. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we're like, this, this is, is it. it. Yeah. We did the financial projections we you know we're like yeah we'll sell like 20 cases a week per store you know there's thousands of people going in everyone's gonna want this and we put these projections together and we start getting ready to go into 
five hundred stores. Yeah. With no idea how much it's actually going to sell, you know. Yeah. And start ramping up, and what they did is they put us in four regions first, and so for about ninety days, and with like a sales quota to hit, right? And so we doubled the team. We went from three people to six people, and then we had, in total, we probably had like fifteen people doing demos, you know. Yeah. And we split up between these four regions and just start selling this truffle salt. Literally, all of us are doing demos in Whole Foods stores. You you can book two a day, right? So we're all in Whole Foods stores for like sixteen hours a day. Yeah. And we have other people. We've hired other people to go into the top stores, right? Any any store that has good foot traffic at the uh, end of 2019, we were in that Whole Foods store doing a product demo for this truffle salt. <laughs> Straight hustling. Every, every, literally every single day. And yeah. then we would sell truffles on the days we were not in the stores. Yeah. And so we eventually in February, at the end of February, we got the phone call from one of the regional presidents and we got the green light to go into – the rest of the stores. At this stage, we're at about 100. The goal is to get into 500. Yeah. And so it's for the truffle salt, truffle hunting. And again, we think this is like our holy grail, right? We're like, we have found the scalable answer to this business. And we get that green light and we get ready to go into all these stores. And to get ready for something like this, like you got to think like you have no idea what they're going to sell, right? And mm-hmm. if you need – so. If you're selling the Whole Foods, you need cases, right? To get six-pack cases made, right, you have to buy ten to 20000 at a time, right? The first time you get it made, each case is, like, around, like, $2, right? So we go from a business, right, we don't have any money, and now we need to figure out how to get, you know, around $100,000 together. And so at some point, we had brought in a little bit of investment, and then when we needed some money to launch in Whole Foods— Mitch came out and we did a presentation for Mitch. Yeah. And Mitch put a hundred thousand dollars into the company for us to launch at Whole Foods. And so, you know, just to speak to that, like literally we went from cooking for Mitch. Yeah. You know, cooking the food that he was eating on the table to sitting at the same table with him. Yeah. And that just speaks to the level of character of who he, him and his wife are. And so, I mean, literally, they came here. Yeah. They flew their private jet to Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a rental car, drove to the, the, you know, neighborhood that we're in right here, which is not a nice neighborhood. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and literally, <laughs> we're like, hey, Mitch, you want us to move our car out so you can put your car in? And he's like, no, 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 this is a rental. If they steal this, that's okay, but don't let them steal your car, right? Yeah. Like, that was his thought process. He's like, ah, they can steal this rental, but no, keep your car in the gate. And so he comes in here, and literally we put this presentation together for him on what we're going to do when we launch in Whole Foods. And um, he agrees to invest, and he puts up the money for us to launch in Whole Foods. And so when we're getting ready for this launch, right, We get everything needed to go into 500 stores as we're growing the fresh truffle business. Yeah. And as we all know now, at some point, COVID hit, right? And when I say COVID hit, I'm really talking about the day that the shelter-in-place, when everyone started getting the shelter-in-place alerts on their phone. Was it March 13th? Yeah. Something like that. And right, the first the one was Santa Clara County, which is right here. Yeah. And I did not even know that that was a thing. Yeah. You know, I, I maybe I should have. I don't know. I literally didn't know shelter in place was – I did not know you could just make people stay home. Well, I, yeah, I had no idea either. I mean, up until this time, when have we ever experienced that? Right. You know, ever. And, I mean, it's such a nice name too, shelter in place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a vacation. Like they. Don't call it lockdown because that's what it is. Yeah, you know? like a spa or something it, to go to. <laughs> people would have started rioting a lot faster if they called it lockdown. Yeah, for sure. And so when that happens, then all the restaurants shut down. Yeah. Oh, Whole yeah. Foods pauses the rollout. And me and Tyler had to do this little calculation that we always do. Basically, to figure out our working capital. And you take 
your accounts receivable plus all the cash in the bank minus what you owe in either accounts payable or the credit card. Yeah. And then that will either give you a negative or a positive number. And if it gives you a negative number, then you need to figure out how to sell whatever you have lying around to make that number positive. Uh Uh-huh. Or if it is positive, then you're good. Right? And when we did that calculation, we were negative $60,000. Oh, my God. And when, that was including accounts receivable. Yeah. Right? Now, no restaurant is about to pay us. Hell no. So you take accounts receivable out of the equation, and we're, you know, we're just not in a good in place. The juice, yeah. And we look at this, and the next day I get a phone call from Leah, and Leah, and yeah. she is... She's now in charge of all of our private events, right? Okay. Literally, she's done over $2 million in sales in private events, Whoa. right? And she calls and says that her husband, who runs two or two incredible restaurants, you know, and this, she's told me that I can share this, um, that he just got laid off and they cut his salary. Yeah. And so she asked me, she's like, I just need to know, am I going to get furloughed? Yeah. And I was like, Leah, I'm, we will make a commitment to not furlough anybody. And we had like some like contract workers with us, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but then whole foods paused all the demos, you know? So we couldn't even, there's no way we could even keep them working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we made a commitment to not furlough any of our employees, any of the team members. Right. And so, here we are, negative. Yeah. You know, and then there's no viable sales options. Restaurants aren't buying truffles. And even if they think they are, they don't have the money to pay for them. Exactly. You know, and then Whole Foods, and then even if Whole Foods were to take on all that product, the sales projections, like, who is, like, people are killing each other for toilet paper. Yeah. Like, who is worried about? They're going to be buying truffle salt. Exactly. And so here we are as a business, and for about three days, honestly, I kept I kept replaying the scene in Blow, where, and when I say replay, I mean like constantly, you know, like going back to how you talk to yourself, right? Yeah. I kept replaying the scene of the kid at the dinner table and his parents arguing about money, right? Yeah. And then him working so hard, right, to like fix that wrong in his life. Yeah. And then getting to a point where that movie ends with him arguing with his wife about money while their kid is at the dinner table. Yeah. And I kept playing this, like, amnesia scene in my head, and I felt like my dad. I felt like I had grown this business. I was a little too far on the edge. And then we got hit with something, just like when 2008 hit. We got hit with this pandemic, and I thought I was going to lose this business. And so I I 100% was angry and terrified. And it, we had, uh, you know, a couple days in there, and then Mitch comes back out, and we do a presentation for Mitch, right, on what we did with Whole Foods, right? Yeah. And we had done every single thing that we said we would do. We hit these sales numbers, we put these teams in place, we launched these products, we got this organized, and... Mitch literally looked at me and he said, well, what are we doing here? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, are you raising money or not? And I was like, Mitch, if you're interested in putting more money in this company, we are raising money. Yeah. And he says, okay, how much of this company will I own if I put in another $100,000 today? And we're sitting right here and it's me, Tyler, Tyler's stepdad, Bob, who's was our legal counsel, Mitch, Alice, and then Sarah and Ian, right? And you could just feel the animosity in the air. Yeah. And we write it out on paper, and we're like, you'll own, uh, came out to like 13%. And at this stage, a lot of people would, I honestly think a lot of people would have, I think a lot of people don't understand equity enough to understand the value of partners, yeah. You know? And Mitch is a guy who I will always take as a partner in my business. Yeah. And 
it's thirteen percent, and I had heard Mitch a time before say that he likes to have fifteen percent in companies. And so, in that moment, I was like, Mitch, another hundred thousand dollars will get you this much. Would you like to own fifteen percent of Shuffle Shuffle? And he says, Yes, I would. How much do I have to write? Tell me how much I have to write on a check to own 15% of Truffle Shuffle today. Yeah. Because in this moment, I'm doing this calculation. All right, if we're $60,000 in the hole, we have six people on the team. $60,000 is going to get us, you know, two and a half months. We're in a pandemic. We're still going to be in the same exact position in two and a half months. Yeah. And so I was like, we need just a little bit more money to, because you need some money to figure something out. Yeah. Right. And so. It came out to one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars, and in that, and he wrote us a check for one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars the day the stock market crashed in the middle of a pandemic for a business that was eighty percent to restaurants when every single restaurant in America was closed. Whoa! And that is belief. Yeah, that is hope. That is yeah. And after that moment, we made a decision. You know, I don't know what you want to call it a uh you know not to get like religious or anything but like a like a a commitment right to one day write mitch a check back that there would be no way that we would ever lose his money and that we will figure out a way to make sure we write him a check back and the next day we get a phone call from the battery asking if we want to do a virtual cooking class for their top members and that that was a phone call that completely changed it for our business. Yeah. And so I remember you guys were like, "Hey, uh, we're doing this video. You want to come do an intro?" Yeah. It's like, "Yeah, I'll come do an intro. It's a pandemic, baby, and nobody <laughs> working. I'm fine." <laughs> we had we had What did you call yourself at that time? Um, I think I was just rolling with Susio at that time. I think it was either Susia or David Susia. Yeah, something like that. But uh, I remember you guys were like, it was a whole setup, man. It was a whole production. I remember we are like, okay, we got to do this, we got to do that. And then uh, I remember also that I had no idea what it was for. You guys, you guys were like, hey, just make this. We're doing this video. I said, <laughs> All right, cool. Let's do this video. I don't even know what it's for. Um, but that ended up being the beginning of something great. Yeah. Of something that has turn how many months is it now you know we'll, 10 11 no this since March. Week will be our 40th like sunday class 40th sunday class but in total we've done about 350 cooking classes yeah in the past nine months yeah and uh you know since then i've watched your business grow you've outgrown this space into uh the loading dock place you were at for a little while um yeah. And then now you own a straight noodle house. Yeah. Well, it used to be a noodle house. But yeah. It's a big-ass factory. Um, I couldn't be more proud of you, man, and Tyler. Um, so you're doing these videos. We're doing these videos. I come in sometimes. You're doing them. Uh, and you're great behind the camera, man. You got, you know, <laughs> you got presence. And uh, Tyler, I think, also found some presence, even though he yeah, he does a, great. a little shy, but he does awesome. Um what was the growth of that program? Like, how did how did you see, like, you do this class for the battery, and then after that, what happens in your brain, and what's, like, the next steps? So, you know, it, it kind of goes back to, like, the promises you make to yourself, you know? So, yeah. like, when we first started this business, our goal was to make it worth $10 million by the end of 2020. Yeah. Right? And every, I, I have to say, I, you know, just watch my dad build a business. Like I, I like business, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, every time I would run the scenarios through my head on with the products and the fresh truffles, I felt one day we could get to $10 million total revenue. Yeah. Right. And so $10 million for most companies in this area in Silicon Valley is nothing. Right. It's an unbelievable amount of money to chefs, to these guys, it's nothing. And so it's never a business that anyone's going to try to acquire. And so the reason I'm saying that is because when we did that first cooking class, right, kind of two things happened. One was we did that you know, 
you know, we, we were just going for it, right? And when we when that thing first hit the website, we completely sold out of truffles, completely sold out of the experience. We really had no idea what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. We didn't prep anything. Like, that's how much we literally didn't want to spend the money to prep anything because we didn't know if we would sell anything. Yeah. And so, and as you remember, when we did that first class, it was on Facebook Live, so you couldn't see people cooking. Yeah. But then we got to the end of it, and all these people started tagging us. And we're getting hundreds of tags in. By the end of that day, over a thousand people had watched that video. Yeah. And when we saw people tagging the dishes that they cooked at home, you know, Michelin quality truffle risotto with fresh truffles on it, it, seeing how happy it made people, right? And then also seeing it was the first time where I like thought about the business and I was like, I actually have no idea. Idea what the potential could be here mm-hmm. because everybody eats food on planet earth yeah everybody wants to learn how to cook better and everybody wants to be able to eat better food and what happened as we kept growing this thing is that we built this community of people and our kind of motto now is cook together and so you know every sunday hundreds of people join us from their own homes to cook along with us step by step and through this, you know, very isolating time in history, it has felt unbelievably joyous to Truffle Shuffle because of all the people that we get to cook with every week. There's literally, I've actually got complaints from people that join the classes angry with me because they think I've sold them an experience with all of my friends and family. (laughs) And I'm like, there's there's hundreds of people on this, and I've never met a single person. Yeah. But it has become such a community that peop- more than just one person has literally complained and been like, everyone on here is just clearly friends with the chef. Yeah. I don't understand why you guys are selling tickets to something like this. Yeah. And that's how incredible of a community, when we explain that, you see people like their jaws drop. You yeah. Know? I don't know anybody. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was here um, a couple of weeks ago when you guys did the um, the salmon Benedict, the smoked salmon Benedict, mm-hmm. and you know, from where you guys have grown to now, you know, you guys had a musical guest, you had special guest um, Travis from Aloha, mm-hmm. um, you know, come talk about about the fish and the product, and that it's remarkable. You know, to to see how much growth you've had in eight months is crazy. And, you know, where are you going from here? Where are we taking this? Where is it going? So, honestly, the goal, we – the growth has been incredible. And the goal now is to figure out how to get as many people as possible to cook together. And to use Shuffle Shuffle as a platform to help chefs. And so the way that I see this is if we could build out a platform very similar to Audible. Yeah. Right? So, like, I'm at, like you're a chef. You spend your entire life cooking. You have a skill set developed, you know? Yeah. It's truly like an asset. It's an asset that you can utilize, right? And so... The difference between an asset and a skill set is uh, an asset is something that you utilize to monetize, right? Yeah. And so you take that asset and imagine if you could log on to this platform and record videos of you showing people how to make your favorite dishes, right? And then it goes out there and very similar to audiobooks, right? People could buy video classes or cooking classes at a time. Some are recorded, some are live, and then it stores in their bank of library of their favorite cooking experiences. Yeah. And so looking at it with something like that, but ultimately just really focusing on the experience and helping people cook together. And I think what we do here and what has, the reason why it has been so successful so quickly is because we're truly trying to figure out how to help people cook as best as possible. Yeah. You know, when you look at a lot of like Food Network recipes, everything's kind of dumbed down, right? Yeah. And it was dumbed down for, you know, before COVID, nobody had, nobody could find time on their Google calendar to cook dinner. 
Yeah. Right? You know? So it was dumbed down, you know, the 30 minute meals, everything like that. And what we're trying to focus on here is cooking those dishes that when you eat it, 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 transports you you know yeah the same dishes you go out and eat at a michelin star restaurant and so really focusing on that and figuring out a way to bring this to the people bring it to anyone that is looking for it and then really looking at experiences we have a couple of really cool things lined up we're doing a truffle risotto class and then afterwards we're gonna we're literally partnering with an entire symphony so you'll do the truffle risotto class, and then we're going to figure out how to live stream an entire symphony. That so awesome. you're eating the risotto, and you know we do this like joke where we play a symphony, and so literally I figured out how to get a hold of of a straight symphony of a symphony, and so that will be something people do after the risotto class, and then for New Year's Eve we're looking to partner with uh, SF Speakeasy on doing like the 100 year anniversary of the Speakeasy. Whoa. So 2021 so cool. and do it virtual. So if you could imagine people, thousands of people, you know, at home in speakeasy attire, like yeah. the 1920s, you know, and we do it virtual. And so we'll send them the, – the difference of what we do is we make it interactive by sending them part of the experience. Yeah. When you just log on, it's just TV. But when you send people part of the experience, and so we'll send them a charcuterie board with caviar and everything like that. And then we're going to, we're still organizing the details, but we're going to send people like, you know, glitter and sparklers and streamers and things for them to celebrate the ball dropping at home. Yeah. And then first we'll do a little, we'll set up the uh, charcuterie board with them. Yeah. Show them how to eat the caviar and then. Hand it over to the guys at SF Speakeasy, and they're going to literally do a 1920s-style New Year's Eve show for them. That's so cool, man. Hell yeah. So I, I want to thank you for, for doing this with me, um, and I want to thank you for uh, donating meals to the first responders. You know, during this pandemic, you guys were on top of growing this new you know, business pivot, you also made time to do that. So that's something that's very commendable, this Truffle Shuffle, and I'm proud to be uh, now officially sponsored by Truffle Shuffle. All right. So, uh, Jason, once again, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure I'll have you on here soon. Um, we're actually going to do a duo podcast with you and Tyler on here. Nice. Talk about some upcoming things. Um, but for all you out there, thank you for listening. Uh, you can find Jason McKinney at truffleshufflesf.com. Boom. Instagram is at truffleshuffle underscore SF. Bam. There you go. Show some love. Uh, they're live every Sunday with their classes um, uh, on Instagram Live and Facebook Live, I think, right? So they're everywhere. Check them out. Jason, thank you very much. This is Sucio Talk signing out. I hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope you all enjoyed it. Hope y'all 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 enjoyed it. Hope y'all.